if an exchange shows you a balance, you have no idea if they really have those funds. As we've seen with FTX, uh, which I heard, I don't know, but I heard that they didn't even have any Bitcoin. They sold a lot of Bitcoin and they didn't even have any Bitcoin specifically. So that is just not possible with ARK. I think that alone is, is a huge improvement that, that people really need to appreciate that you can just run a fractional reserve and, and don't have that risk. I guess we can begin. So uh, today we're going to talk about ARC, uh, which is a new layer two Bitcoin protocol. Uh, I myself am learning about this as we go. Uh, the more I study about it, the more excited I get. Seems uh, like a major uh, technical development. It's certainly a very exciting one. Um, some people have described it as an upgrade for Lightning or trust minimized Xiaomi and Mints, uh, or um, sometimes I've even heard uh, a sidechain or something. But Moon Settler today will explain to us how um, this new protocol uh, improves upon what we have, what kind of problems does it address, and why should we all be excited about this. So I'll begin with a, a quick introduction. Uh, I am Sina from BitGuide. Uh, we've uh, established BitGuide for about a year. We're focusing on Bitcoin education and helping the um, uh, onboarding. Uh, RK on the stage is my partner in crime here. Uh, so if you want to check out our website, it's bitguide.io. And we have some uh, Bitcoin courses Still working on content and developing. We also do have a podcast and uh, recently began our newsletter. And I'm hoping to write an article from um, these uh, discussions uh, on our Substack newsletter as well in the upcoming days. Um, and so uh, maybe have a couple minutes for Moon Settler to introduce himself. And if you can confirm that you can hear me okay, I appreciate it. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, I'm Moon Settler, and I am very excited about uh, taking Bitcoin to billions of people, hopefully. And uh, it seems like uh, Covenants should be the, the next uh, step forward that we take in Bitcoin development. I mean, the evidence just keeps piling on. So very shortly about me, I, I uh, briefly worked on show many cash uh, proof of liabilities and, and pro proofs uh, conceptually and uh, have the, the cashew team uh, uh, led by Kale BTC to implement uh, discrete uh, logarithmic equivalence proofs, uh, DLAC proofs. And uh, basically, uh, these allow you to uh, to prove that the, the Mint has used the private key that it is supposed to use for signing the blind signature and it can't secretly tag you. So it's good for privacy. And later on, we can do all sorts of exciting things with this. So that's what I, I worked on before. And when I saw that, uh, you know, we we can pretty much create the perfect banks with, on Bitcoin with these uh, Chomini cash mints, um, where fractional reserve will not be an option, hopefully, and where you have privacy. And the whole thing is a, is a very good user experience. I, uh, of course, immediately reverted to thinking about how to uh, minimize the trust for your, your savings, right? Because uh, these uh, daily spending amounts are, are easily replaceable. So we can see that, uh, that uh, with these means we will be able to scale to billions of people. And, uh, and we will be able to do it better than 
the traditional account system. And uh, so I, I was like, okay, okay, that's good. At least uh, we have a huge improvement over the old system there, but, but it would be nice if people could self custody, uh, if they could hold their own keys, even if they wouldn't own a UTXO alone on chain, uh, even, even then it would be nice if, uh, if they could not be rugged. And so I started to uh, think about how you could combine the privacy properties of eCash uh, with, uh, you know, these uh, proposed uh, covenant pools where people could share custody but fall back to on chain if uh, cooperation breaks down. And so I did not even know that uh, other people were entertaining the same ideas. It was a very crazy uh, you know, uh, convergent evolution of ideas. Multiple people have attacked the same problem space, had the same ideas and and worked and we, we didn't know about uh, what the others are thinking because we have not been communicating. And uh, it was pretty crazy when I realized uh, when, when uh, Burak came uh, forward with, uh, back then he called it TBD XXX to be determined. <laughs> and uh, it was not revealed to be ARC. Uh, uh, he had this alternative uh, layer too. And, and uh, basically uh, there are a lot of common points with what I was working on. They have both uh, show me unblinded off-chain key swap protocols with uh, on-chain enforceable virtual UTXOs held by the users and the central coordinator. But there are very big key differences. And overall, I think uh, I think Arc uh, Burak's work is actually actually more revolutionary. So uh, it it uh, if, uh, if if we can do it properly, if we have the the proper primitives on uh, layer one, and we can do this layer two properly, it will be a lot less interactive uh, than anything. Uh, uh, we have been trying to build before. And that means that basically you are going to have roughly the same experience as you would have with the custody or lightning wallet, right? And, and that's the experience that people, user experience that people seem to want. So they are very popular. I, I, I think uh, we, we can clearly see that Wallet of Satoshi is a highly popular wallet because you can receive offline to your lightning address, right? Uh, you can immediately spend the funds that you are given. Uh, you have no problem paying lightning invoices. You have no problem. Uh, you don't have to manage your channel liquidity. You don't have to pay on-chain fees directly, right? You, you are freed from all this burden. You are just using lightning and having fun. So that's the, that's the lure, the allure of, of these uh, custody wallets. But of course the custodian knows everything about what you are doing. So all your activity is tied to your account and uh, they know your balance and you have no idea if they have the Bitcoin for it. Like you, you literally can know. And uh, it's, it's basically just the old banking world and uh, it, it's probably going to have the exact same problems as the old banking world. So we have managed to rec recreate that on Bitcoin and it's widely popular. And, and ARC, ARC seems like, uh, you know, uh, being able to do something better. All right, so I I was just supposed to introduce myself, but I rushed ahead, I guess. No, that was good. That was cool. Um, thanks a lot for that. So we all hope to see Bitcoin adopted by billions of people and uh, and, and see uh, scaling solutions that actually work and are able to accommodate uh, such scale. Um, Lightning is doing a pretty good job there, but it has issues, right? So uh, yes. what, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the limitations or constraints that we have with Lightning and uh, which basically might, might, might put a, cap on how fast they could grow or how many people could be onboarded. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people just, uh, you know, boob Lightning as the ultimate scaling solution. And it is true that Lightning uh, basically 
if, if you are only looking at the possible transactions per second, then the Lightning Network uh, like really blew out the gates on, on this one. So we can get some pretty crazy high numbers in theory. In practice, I'm not sure if it's more than a rounding error compared to Bitcoin's transaction per second on main chain. Like uh, it's hard to, hard to tell how much it actually odds. I doubt it odds an entire transaction per second. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a fraction of that and uh, in practice. Uh, but this is, this is just all about how people are using it. It's not a limitation thing. But Lightning does not scale the number of people that can hold their own keys, the, the number of people that, that are not in custody. Lightning does not do anything about that. What Lightning does is it creates a payment system that is, uh, that is very much competitive with uh, the credit card system that we have today. So this, this uh, point of sale terminal world that, that uh, most people are interacting with when they are purchasing things and, and uh, just living the life, uh, Lightning basically offers that user experience and it does it very well. And uh, we can already, already see that if, uh, if people are, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically banked by custodians that are interconnected with the Lightning Network, then we can scale to the global population. I think this has been proven that that system works. And uh, it, it, it still does not solve custody. And it actually still has some open questions about, you know, how, how large the Lightning Network can get, how consolidated it will get, and uh, under what, uh, what pressures, like the liquidity or the roots, uh, the routing complexity. So what will be the main limiting factor, how, how decentralized and mesh like the Lightning Network can get, or how Hub and Spoke like uh, and and uh, centralization prone it will be so there are multiple factors with the lightning network that uh, that shape and some are centralizing some are decentralizing and uh, and basically a lot of people are working very hard so so that lightning can work and and there are a lot of potential developments still and uh, it's all very exciting but uh, we can see that people at scale are not going to manage their own channels. I, I think that is becoming very obvious. And the entire notion, uh, when Burak talks, talks about uh, this stuff and how he tried to fix lightning, he often talks about the insanity of expecting someone to secure liquidity before they are getting paid. So if someone wants to send me like a million Satoshis on lightning, and my channel capacity is 10,000 Bitcoin, my e-band capacity, then he will not be able to send me that amount, right? I, I have to know that he wants to send me that amount. I have to talk to a lightning service provider. I have to uh, ask him for inbound liquidity. This has its own chain cost and, and all, all kinds of things. And so Burak looked at it from a UX persp perspective and he really really try to, to solve a whole bunch of issues. And the very crucial issue was this privacy aspect, right? So if we are accepting this hub and spoke model for the, for the end users, for the plebs, for the average people, and they are just going to be connected to large uh, lightning service providers anyhow, uh, it is very hard to imagine how the lightning service provider will not be able to tell everything about what people are doing how they are transacting with, with each other, how the funds are flowing, who is who, and, 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 uh, and stuff like that. And uh, in that world, uh, uh, along with the, this uh, problem that you are locking in, uh, locking in liquidity into these channels, and it's all very inflexible, it, it just uh, predicts that this whole system is, is not, not going to provide a good user experience this way. And it will naturally trend uh, towards a system where people don't actually hold their uh, UTXOs, their, their keys on chain. And of course, there are alternative uh, ways that people are trying to make Lightning better. So uh, channel splicing, for example, is uh, something that people are 
very exciting about. So uh, with these taproot music channels and and the uh, splicing dining coin joins, uh, we could uh, move liquidity around in a more cost efficient and private manner. So there is that. People are working on channel factories as an idea, and uh, <clears throat> that is a more hierarchical uh, way of uh, of uh, basically splitting up a channel liquidity for multiple people who can settle between each other or resize, rebalance, rebalance their channels, uh, preferably on off chain. Uh, someone wants to say something. Hey, yes, hi. I, can you guys hear me? I can, yeah, yes. Yeah, perfect. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I was not sure if you want to, like, uh, finish your point and then uh, take questions. Because, uh, I mean, the question I wanted to ask was, I, I was speaking to uh, Stefan today. I met him today at the conference personally. And I asked him, how much did you understand after doing this episode with, uh, with Burak? And he was like, hmm, 60 to 70 percent. So even he didn't understand everything. So it's, it's still like a, a lot of learning for everyone, I guess. So I was I was just wondering how exactly this uh, network would work with Lightning. Is there any sort of uh, connection between the two or is this going to be non-compatible with Lightning? Yes. Uh, so uh, Buddha tried to create better lightning wallet in every which way that that's what he set out to do right he, he just wanted a better lightning wallet for people a better way to interact with the lightning network that was his goal and uh, and uh, basically he kept working on it and he realized at one point that this was not lightning anymore this was a, a completely different novel new layer 2 system for bitcoin that can work without lightning but can interact with lightning and like I said, Lightning has some fortes. So it is very good as an instant settlement network, an instant trustless settlement network, and, and a very good competitor for the, the point of sale systems. Uh, and uh, I believe Lightning will continue to exist in this role. Uh, I, I just think if we get ARC especially, uh, most people with their daily spending will not interact with Lightning directly. So they will either use a custody leakage wallet or they will use something like an ARC wallet. And uh, they will only interact with the Lightning Network to uh, these providers. And uh, they will manage the complexity associated with, uh, you know, uh, having your Lightning channel and, and having to secure liquidity and having to rebalance your channels and and uh, deal with uh, routing and stuff like that. So I believe the two layer twos will coexist uh, and uh, they really complete each other. If you are, if you just, uh, so the Chomia means have been, have been tried a few times before, right? It's like 40 years older than Bitcoin or something like that. And it never caught on. So somehow people were not really interested in it because you could only transact with people who are uh, basically in the same mint. So it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's only mildly useful. And what Bitcoin did is uh, made it possible with the Lightning Network to send, uh, send the e-cash from one mint to another. So if I'm in mint A and you are in mint B and I want to pay you, then you don't have to trust my mint. I don't have to trust your mint. Uh, the mints are settling on the Lightning Network between each other trustlessly. And we are all having a relationship with our own mints. So, so there already, we can already see outlined how this uh, thing works in, in a future where Lightning does not really scale to individuals, but, but it, uh, it just provides this glue that holds the, the entire ecosystem together. And uh, ARC is basically the same. On, only difference is it um, really works at a larger scale. So, uh, Chomi mini cash means can be of any size, literally, can be a family size thing. So, maybe the family has a, a single Lightning node and, and uh, that doesn't actually want to know how much the kids are uh, 
spending on ice cream or, or something else. So he can set up this Xiaomi and Rikesh Mint and, uh, and the whole thing can work uh, that way. Or, or it can be a pretty sizable thing like a, a, a bank, a financial institution, an exchange could actually run a Xiaomi and Rikesh Mint. It, it, it is very scalable, but it also works on, on very small scale. It's very flexible. Arc, uh, since it has a larger on-chain presence, the way Brock uh, describes it, uh, like a new Arc pool transaction is being pushed into the mempool every five seconds or so. Uh, it, it has a larger on-chain presence, but it is a constant size on-chain uh, footprint. That means the, the more people are in it, the more people are in, in the Arc pool, um, basically the more efficient it gets. And, uh, and so it is very likely that, uh, and because it is very liquidity intensive also, so, so it, it requires a lot of liquidity, it is very likely that uh, these ESPs are not going to be small operations. So they are going to be hundreds of thousands of uh, Bitcoins or, or maybe million Bitcoin sized uh, ARC service providers uh, that, are, that are doing this. And, uh, and basically, you are, uh, you are in uh, a construct where you can unilaterally withdraw your, your savings. At least we know that if you have significant savings, if, if you have a significant amount that is not uh, near or below the dust limit, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, what, what the dust limit means uh, for Bitcoin users, uh, then, then you can enforce your property rights on chain so the ARC service provider cannot steal from you. And the most, more importantly than that, uh, the ARC service provider really has no way of, of printing Bitcoin, paper Bitcoin, fake Bitcoin out of thin air. So he, he can, just, can, can just dump Bitcoin on you that doesn't exist, right? The, uh, fractional reserve banking on ARC is not really possible. And uh, I, I personally believe that is a very, very important thing. And it, it will be so easy to slip up and just go for the cheaper, simpler experience uh, uh, with custodial Bitcoin and, and let go of this thing. And uh, predictably, based on history, human behavior and incentives and, and stuff, uh, we, can, we can predict that uh, in a custodial scaling future, the 21 million Bitcoin limit is going to be broken, where the liquidity is, where the economic activity is. It may be true on chain, maybe on chain we will never experience an inflation, but in effect where, where people are using Bitcoin and, and how they are getting it, how they are getting the loans and stuff, uh, it could be many, 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 many times higher uh, available supply if, if we are not doing this right. And that is a major concern, I believe. Uh, every Bitcoin holder uh, should be wary of that. I mean, depending on what you think about Bitcoin, because some people actually think that a fixed monetary supply cannot work for mankind. And those people might actually rejoice at the thought that we can just make a bullshit Bitcoin, fake Bitcoin, and we can just dump it on people and, and have a more flexible supply. Uh, but, but those that are more uh, inclined to the Austrian school and the, the, the deflationary currency thing, those, uh, and those people who want Bitcoin to appreciate naturally with the, uh, with the scarcity uh, uh, dynamics, those people might not actually want to experience this uh, debasement, right? And uh, I'm among those who say that maybe we should try out this thing, right? So maybe we should not just let go of, of, of this thing uh, from the get-go and, and we should really really give it a try uh, see how it works uh, and bitcoin can coexist maybe with the fiat system but uh, it should not uh, immediately adopt the 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 shenanigans of the fiat system so i mean this is actually i think one of the biggest you know fears i have is is similar with um one of the tangents that happened with gold, which is that, you know, it doesn't really make sense to self custody small amounts or to, you know, like to, to do that, right? You're not going to assay like your little flake of gold. <laughs> um, and it's actually like, it's not really feasible to send around gold in small amounts, right? I think the same thing will happen with Bitcoin on chain, as you were saying. But what I'm actually afraid of is, you know, I don't think ARC 
necessarily solves this problem. It does. I mean, it, it, it does on the face, right? Because, you know, you kind of have this like meta self custody with these VTXOs. You can bring them on chain at any time, theoretically. But if on chain fees are consistently high, I mean, you know, maybe they're going to be in the hundreds or thousands of V bytes or sats per V byte, you know, if, if, if we've got hundreds of thousands or millions of plebs sharing them, right? You can, I can imagine they'd get that high. Then that's really restricting the, the size of VTXOs you can ever bring back on chain, right? I mean, you're going to be stuck on the arc and, you know, and the arc is permissioned, right? It's, it's trustless, but it's permissioned. So the ASP can basically stop, you know, <laughs> processing your transactions if they don't like you or if all you have is really small VTXOs. And then you're going to, there's nothing you can do. So like, you know, that's one of the yeah. biggest problems. Although they don't, they don't actually Too know. Hard, yeah. They, block they size don't actually increase. know. Block size increase fixes that. Right. That's so the so they other. don't actually know <laughs> what you have. They, they don't know you. It, it's more similar to the eCash system. So they see these bills of widely varying uh, denominations and they have no idea if you are a billionaire or, or, or you are just a, a, a guy that uh, lives paycheck to paycheck in, in theory. So uh, what I wanted to say, the, the thing about the supply not being able to be diluted covertly still stands. Even if, even if you can't economically enforce your near and below dust amounts on chain, at least not alone, and, and uh, you can still uh, make sure that the ARC service provider actually loses more on trying to screw you. So this is your decision. Um, and uh, the way ARC will work most likely is that these uh, near and below uh, dust amounts are going to be padded by the, the service provider. So the service provider is going to lock in a lot of uh, its liquidity on these one sub uh, VTXOs. And uh, if you if you do push it on chain, maybe you will lose sats on that. But the the ESP is going to lose more sats on that. So it, it, it it's a lose lose situation. You we can actually get to a lose lose situation, which is by the way very similar to Lightning. If you have uh, below dust amounts, you can't have proper HTLCs on Lightning. So what you are going to have is uh, they are going to have uh, these. Uh, commitment transactions and the difference goes to the, the miners basically. Um, and uh, that's the best you can do with not on-chain enforceable amounts that you make sure that the miners get it and uh, not either uh, party on the channel or, or in a contract. And uh, <clears throat> basically ARC is very similar in this manner that you can make sure that the ASP does not get it that the ASP has to spend more uh, on this thing uh, than what he could gain uh, if he tries to screw with people. Wait, wait, but one second, though. If, if, the, if the dust padding is there, but it's still not above the required amount to pay an on-chain fee to bring it back on-chain, then that dust padding doesn't actually do anything, right? Because a user can't unira uni unilaterally exit if they don't have enough sats to pay you know the the fee to to do that and the dust panning is not going to be enough if fees are raised to hundreds or thousands of sats per byte. yeah so that could be a situation like i said if the asp would know that you only have like 100 satoshis then uh, can you guys hear, hear me by the way because i had the uh, headset issues i do yep all right, so if you if the ASP would know that you only have 100 Satoshi, then he might have been confident about uh, you not wanting to enforce that on-chain, even though he would lose like uh, 5,000 Satoshis on it, if you did, you know, something like that. Uh, just just uh, trying to fee bump it might uh, be beyond your capability, but he doesn't actually know that you only have 100 Satoshi, so he has no idea. He has no idea how upset people will get if he tries to play games. Uh, his business will be gone. It's almost certain that he will, uh, you know, have to pay more on on some people getting out, like uh, getting uh, fed up and upset and don't mind losing a few sets to to just uh, force things on chain. 
So it, it's a very, very unpredictable game for him. He really doesn't have anything to gain by it uh, if, if it's set up properly. I know there is some problem with the unpredictability of the on-chain fee market. So if you imagine a world where these on-chain fees are going to be very, very highly varied within this four-week period, so we are going to have empty blocks and just huge congestion and, and these things come and go. In a world like that, it's very hard to plan ahead. Uh, Arc is more suited to a world where you have, uh, you have more predictable high fees. So the fees are high, but, but, but you, can, you can easily predict. And the, the ASP has to overpay for its weight a lot uh, to, to provide a good experience uh, for the users. <clears throat> and uh, in an environment like that, it, it can actually find an equilibrium. It can actually work, I believe. So I, I don't see this as a as a, an arc killer uh, argument. I, I see this as something that will naturally find an equilibrium and 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 it will find a way to work. And like I said, if we come back a little bit, so these things just by the virtue of them uh, being on chain liquidity divided further to virtual UTX. So by that virtue, it's actually an over collateralized scheme so arc is arc is not a 100 percent collateralized scheme if you wish uh, it's not a 100 percent reserve it's more close in practice probably to a 200 percent reserve if uh, it depends on the velocity so the velocity how people transact arc has this uh, downside or shortcoming if you wish that if people move their money around a lot uh, very very quickly then the asp is going to need a lot of liquidity if people don't actually do that, if people are just waiting for them to get near expiry and then they just swap over, basically they hodl, uh, then it's not really going to cost a lot of extra liquidity for the ARC service provider. So it really depends on the way people are using it. And the fees are going to be responsive to how much liquidity has the provider has available to it. So I have said it before that with Bitcoin, you are bidding with fees for block space, basically. So people are, are bidding for block space and they are trying to get into the next block. Now with ARC, you actually are bidding for liquidity. So when you want to get into a new ARC pool from your old pool doing a coin join, you are trying to pay someone or you are just mixing whatever, <clears throat> you are actually uh, bidding for this liquidity and you might not actually get into the next uh, ARC pool. Maybe some people are willing to pay more for it or maybe the, the provider has less liquidity available and, and uh, he, he is raising the fees. Maybe you have to wait a little bit. It's, it's like with blocks. So if, if, uh, if the demand is high and uh, you know uh, there is a limit to the available block space, then you might not get into the next block. And it's the same with ARC and liquidity. You, you are bidding for that liquidity and it naturally will find uh, an equilibrium, I believe. And uh, people will be able to use uh, uh, this service. Hey, I, and, I've got a, uh, on, the, on the question on, on fees. So one of the advantages that I've heard for ARC is that, you know, it allows a whole bunch of people to be self-custodial. But I guess my question is like, with the fact that, you know, these are going to be on-chain transactions using ARC as opposed to off-chain, um, like, won't the fees be prohibitive for uh, everyone to have a UTXO? Like, I, I don't think there's enough Bitcoin to go around for people to actually use ARC efficiently. I, I, I'm not sure I understand this correctly, but um, so we have, we have a, a, a limited supply of Bitcoin, of course. And uh, a lot of it is uh, in the hands of uh, large uh, or there's large actors, financial institutions. It's very likely that uh, they're going to be, uh, you know, let's take uh, MicroStrategy and the MicroSailor for a moment. So he has like 100,000 Bitcoin. And uh, how does he make more Bitcoin on that 100,000 Bitcoin without incurring significant risks? So... How, how, how can he actually do that? And uh, one way would be to create an ARC service provider, right? And, uh, and basically let people use this liquidity and, uh, 
and know that uh, so long he can maintain a strong online presence and, and he can enforce his property rights, uh, so long uh, he can actually, uh, you know, retain his funds and, and gather the fees and, uh, and provide, uh, uh, still provide people with uh, an experience that uh, they might actually prefer to, to outright uh, custody. So the thing could find a market fit. And maybe, uh, so you know, my, my uh, question is more for the end users, not the ASP, but it's for like yeah. end users. So like, for example, Lightning, so, um, like I don't, I don't need to pay anything to, well, I pay like a minimal routing fee, right, to transact. And we've seen like in some parts of the world where, I don't know, $10 transaction fees is just too much. There's too much for people to pay. So my understanding yeah. with ARC is that you're going to have to pay a transaction fee to, to do internal and um, to do internal transfers uh, and even to like to peg out. So like, well, yeah, it, it, that depends. Be it depends. Prohibitive? Like, yeah, it depends. It depends. So, so, so Moon, would you want to just do a very quick overview? Because I guess we skipped that part uh of the like how the experience works how do you pick in how do you pick out that sort of thing if all you right. like otherwise we could just continue all right i, I didn't yeah. want to get in, into the weeds just yet uh, I, I want to say one thing about this uh, so <clears throat> you are going to pay on lightning too for the liquidity that you are squatting in fact you might actually pay more so the 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 thing where you are paying minimum minimum routing fees and uh, paying, uh, you know, almost nothing uh, to get liquidity is going to come to a very quick end if more people will get onboarded to Lightning. So that thing won't exist. Like literally in, in a high adoption future, it's going to cost a lot to, to be uh, on the Lightning network and to transact on the Lightning network because these things are coming at a risk. So, so the thing is not entirely riskless uh, routing routing a, an hts is not entirely riskless and and routing a payment below the hts limit is is especially not without risks for the participants and uh, the whole thing has a cost uh, you know you have to manage the channels etc etc it, it is very likely that hobbyists won't be able to even break even so, so that is also a trend that we are seeing on Lightning. And I have personally tried to run a route, Lightning uh, routing node. Uh, I have tried to see if I can at least, you know, get uh, the cost of setting up and managing my channels, at least that uh, I can get back on routing fees. And I couldn't even come close, personally. And... Uh, so, so we are going to see a lot of uh, centralization and professionalism probably coming in there. And even those professionals who are providing this very cheaply today are not going to be able to do so in the future. So in a high, high option future, Bitcoin actually is going to have, uh, <clears throat> have a premium. So real Bitcoin is probably going to have a premium and, and it's going to be, going to be you know, costly to have uh, access to, to real on-chain Bitcoin um, and uh, I, I can totally see that uh, having your own channel would be more expensive, um, even, even if you can afford it, even if you can set it up, uh, it would be more expensive than using ARC because <clears throat> with ARC, you of course have on-chain, you have to pay into the on-chain presence, you have to chip into the fees. But if there are a thousand people in a in a North pool transaction, uh, and they each just pay for like you know ten satoshis, then that's ten thousand satoshi that the the um, the arc uh, arc service provider can uh, offer to the miners as as on chain fee really, or or, or maybe he will just offer the half of it and. And take the other uh, half, uh, you know, for for uh, the cost of his liquidity. And uh, basically, if uh, if um, say we are talking about a future where uh, dollar sub parity is already reached, then we are talking about five thousand dollar transaction fees, which are absolutely prohibitive. I, I think if if you if you look at this uh, Fedimin ethos, like an African village is going to have a Fedimin run by the others, trusted others. 
they are not going to be able to afford five thousand <laughs> five thousand dollars uh, every other month or, or or whatever right that, that's just not going to work and uh, they might actually be able to afford like ten dollars every other month that that might actually work and by the way i have this theory uh, i'm not sure I, I have to talk to burak and have to look into this but i have this notion that actually maybe these uh fed means instead of maintaining their own online presence they can actually uh just run an arc wallet so have the keys you know frost frost these keys that control the vtxos and and interact with an arc service provider so we can see in the future where covenants uh, are activated especially ctv uh, it seems to be a very very uh, fitting uh, way to start uh, if these are activated we are going to see a lot of turtles all the way down as people like to say it so you can compose these structures, you can compose these uh, services into each other a lot. And, uh, and you can do so in a very, very trust minimized way, in on-chain enforceable way where everyone is really incentivized to play along and cooperate. Because by playing our own and cooperating and increasing the interactivity, you remove the need to use the blockchain. So <clears throat> I, no. I have... Uh, can I just add something? Do you hear me? Yes, ask away. Oh yeah, so there was a question earlier that how come they only understand 60 to 80% of, of these ARC talks? And I'm wondering yeah. if maybe it has to do with like the two year head start some of us had with Op CTV and how this is really coming from what Op CTV is, which is itself hard to understand. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if that is the hard to understand part, because I think uh, to, to conceptually understand the uh, covenants is, is pretty easy. So right now on Bitcoin, we have a way we can, we can set the contractual terms to unlock coins. We have, we have this capability to, to set pretty complex or pretty simple uh, contracts up to unlock the, the coins. But we have pretty much no way to restrict how and where they are spent. So that is the current state of Bitcoin, that once someone has a quorum of the keys, he can do whatever he wants. If, if he gets the quorum of your keys that you are using for daily spending, he can just steal your Bitcoins. That is the current state of the Bitcoin network. And what covenants do is they, they uh, place predefined restri restrictions on, on the way or direction this, uh, this uh, uh, UTXO can be spent. So that is the new thing that, that Bitcoin does not have right now. And we, are, we have some ways of, of doing similar stuff, like uh, I can actually uh, generate a private key. I can send funds to that pri uh, the, the public key associated with the private key. I can sign a transaction that sends it to an exchange address or something and then I can destroy that private key and just keep the transaction so the transaction is as important as having the private key because it's really the only way that I can move those coins uh, from this on but let's assume I can really secure this transaction I do not have the same exposure as having the private key if, if this transaction falls into enemy hands then the worst they can do is they can send to my Kraken uh, <laughs> my Kraken account uh, my, my, or, or maybe they can send it to a Casa Multisig that I have set up. I, I did not send my coin to Casa because I like, uh, you know, like them not knowing about how much I have or anything. So I like to maintain my privacy. But and maybe I have an alternative spend pot with a Multisig quorum, anyhow, if I really want to spend. But I have this transaction where I can just push it on chain and it it, it puts my coins into a more secure place or a different place and. And uh, that is what covenants do on a consensus level. So the difference here is that with covenants, I can actually set up a contract that can only spend, uh, you know, into another uh, wallet or, or, or makes a fixed distribution. And that is the only way these uh, coins can move forward. And, uh, and that, this, that is... this all happens at compile time. It's, it's all static and deterministic. Yeah, so, so it, 
it basically from the moment that you have funded this contract, this address that you set up. So, so when you when you create a, a so-called contract, what you are doing is actually you are constructing a script um, to simplify it, and and from that script you are going to generate an address. And uh, people are all familiar with sending coins to addresses. So once you send the coins to this address, then it can only be uh, sent further if you satisfy uh, this contract. And like I said, right now on Bitcoin, we can only satisfy the unlock conditions. But in the future, hopefully with Covenants, uh, we are going to be able to, to restrict how these are spendable. And this is going to open up a whole new world of what we can do in a trust minimized manner. Um, to give you a simple example, let's say, um, <clears throat> let's say uh, I, I would like to, um, in case of, or uh, all right, um, do I do I say something uh, about CTV specifically how it works, or or uh, should we skip that for now? I guess uh, it, it's fine by me. If you think it helps, yeah, go ahead. All right, so uh, object template verify is a, is a or BIP 119, the proposal that have been put forward. And what it does is basically allows you to, to very simply construct an address uh, from which a specific amount of coins can only be spent uh, with, with, with a specific output set, and these outputs are fully committed to, with uh, you know their own scripts, addresses, uh, and uh, the amounts. So nobody, if I if I fund this transaction, if I fund fund this uh, address, uh, create a, a UTXO that is locked with this contract, I can prove it to you that I have paid you, and that it can go. I, I cannot spend it in any other way. It has to go to you. So if I give you this transaction, you have the discretion when you put it on chain. You can do it anytime. You know that you are paid. It, it can cannot go any other way. So basically, it, it can do these uh, deferred settlement things. And uh, maybe, maybe I, I pay you in a way where we have an alternative spend pot. If we both sign in cooperation in the future. So either I paid you one Bitcoin and kept one Bitcoin, or maybe we have an alternative spend pot to this, uh, uh, to this uh, transaction output. And that allows us to, to settle on a different distribution. So let's say I want to buy your car, and that means I'm going to give you 1.5 Bitcoin and not one Bitcoin. And so, so we actually want to settle that. We want to forego the, this original settlement, which is already basically set in stone, confirmed like 500 blocks ago. And, and uh, you basically have those coins, but we, cannot, we can still make this transaction not happen. And, uh, and we can reach a new agreement. And this flexibility is really the key to all these off-chain scaling uh, covenant-based uh, uh, proposed... Uh, experiences or, 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 or ways to think about um, how we can uh, how we can do something more complex with less on-chain footprint I guess uh, some, someone said that we are really uh, aggregating transactions so that's what we can do with covenants you can aggregate transactions and it can all be uh, you know uh, all, all, all how to put it uh, more clearly? So, I guess we can just say trustless. Like, uh, like uh, I, I cannot, I cannot actually double spend you. We can only double spend you together in agreement, and you will not agree to double spend yourself. So, what, what is what is the trade off? What is what is the trade off? I think what what may help is to explain the difference between CTV and. Uh, general covenant so maybe give a couple of examples so so people understand yeah. things so ctv is the simplest really uh, from what i've seen the simplest form of uh, of covenant primitive that is the most restrictive in what it can do and what it does is really um, it commits to a few things like the number of inputs and the n sequences uh, uh, but it does not commit to the input 
transaction outpoint. The transaction outpoint is a, a, a previous transaction ID and the output index. So if you take a vector of the transaction ID and output index, that is uh, what we call a UTXO or transaction outpoint. And, uh, and basically, when you assemble a Bitcoin transaction to sign, you, you take these uh, inputs, you put in the, the various signatures that are needed to satisfy them, you, you, you set the outputs, and uh, as you sign, you hash these things in a particular way. And that particular way is going to ignore the signatures because the signatures just keep changing. So we can't actually, you know, commit to them. It would make no sense. We are only committing to the parts of the transaction that uh, that are uh, set in this uh, partially signed Bitcoin transaction or transaction template or whatever you want to call it. And uh, basically, this is how we we transact on Bitcoin, and this is how we ensure that we are signing the operation that we want to happen. And uh, <clears throat> uh, CTV ignores the import input parts aside from, like I said, the number of inputs. So you can specify the number of inputs that's going to be important. And then you are actually committing to all the outputs. That's, that's the main feature of, of CTV that you are creating a contract that can only be uh, pushed on chain on the transaction that spends it. If certain outputs are paid in exactly the, the specified uh, order and with amounts and, and destinations. So no other way to spend it, just that one. Now, of course, Bitcoin script is pretty powerful and, uh, and Taproot is especially powerful. So uh, you can actually, actually specify uh, multiple branches uh, of conditional spends. That means that you can have a CTV uh, template that uh, specifies a certain distribution. You can have another CTV template that specifies a different distribution. And you can, uh, with some authorization or some logic, decide which one is going to be executed. And uh, that way, uh, you really gain a lot of flexibility over, um, over what you can do, uh, even if the simplest form, when you are just really just having a single CTV check template uh, operation, then, then you are only able to spend the transaction in one particular way and, and, and uh, not another way. Um, basically, it's all up, all up to who sets up the contract and to do what, and, and who can review the contract and under what expectations to agree or not agree on, on uh, you know, getting into this thing. Uh, Vicky, do you want to ask something? I think Oflo uh, had his hand up first. So I'll, I'll let him ask first. I'll let you go first with it and I'll go after you just to be courteous. <laughs> all right, man. Um, all right, all right. Come on, there's just somebody has a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so, I, I mean, I don't want to like go backwards, but I was I was wondering if we could talk about the mechanism of settling the VTXO back on chain and how that works for okay. smaller VTXOs that are padded by the dust. Like, is the dust used as, a, a, yeah. like, can the user basically use that dust padding to pay the, the transaction fee that would be required? Yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. If, if, uh, if this was uh, predicted well or, or overpaid, then he can absolutely do so. Uh, so, the let, let's not complicate things so like i said in the simplest way uh how ctv works is you you actually commit to a predefined distribution so if you have one bitcoin and you are having uh, five outputs all paid uh, 0.2 bitcoins then you can specify this contract however there is a problem with this contract like uh, if uh, it pays zero fees <laughs> it cannot pay fees right if you put in uh, one Bitcoin and, and uh, some Satoshis for the fees, then it is going to pay the exact amount of fees. So what you added, what you funded it with uh, on top of what is distributed, that is going to the fees and it can go to no other way, uh, place. You are not allowed to add another input. You are not allowed to steal from the fees. What you send in is going to come out. Uh, and whatever comes out about the predefined distribution in the template is going to uh, go to fees. 
So if I have a, a, a hundred VTX, so hundred Satoshi VTX, so and I pad it with like um, uh, what is the current average uh, transaction uh, fee? I wonder. So I, I see that it's uh, 10 to 170 sat per V-byte. Let's say, let's say we are calculating with 10, 20 sat per V-byte, um, average transaction is going to be like uh, four or 500 uh, V-bytes. And uh, that means, uh, you know, thousand Satoshis is going to be paid in fees, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter, just assume a particular number for the sake of example. All right, so let's say a thousand Satoshi is going to be paid in fees. And uh, so the ARC service provider is going to actually put the 1,100 Satoshi into that output, which means as you, as you, uh, you know, uh, th that's what he, he will look into it. And uh, that means that when you are trying to, you know, push this on chain, you are probably going to pay the thousand satoshi in fees, and uh, and uh, that that's that's kind of how this thing. Uh, sorry, no. Um, so actually, you have to you have to put it so that it doesn't fall below dust amount. That is an important thing. I'm sorry. So you you have a hundred satoshi that can never hit on chain. In, in this fee environment, right? That, that, that is a below dust amount. If you add the thousand Satoshi and it's a thousand and a hundred Satoshi, then it probably can uh, hit on chain. Uh, actually, you are going to have that VTX and you will need to add additional amounts for the fee padding that is going to probably be offered, uh, you know, as fees uh, with a chai pay for a parent uh, uh, scheme. So. Let's say for simplicity's sake that the uh, ARC service provider locks in 2,500 Satoshis or something like that into this VTXO. And uh, you are going to end up with like a uh, well, 1,000 and 100 Satoshi uh, uh, output on chain if, if you are pushing for it. Uh, that, that's that's, that's kind of how you can you can look at it, but the moment you are trying to spend that thousand and a hundred satoshi, so you have a UTXO that doesn't mean that you can pay someone with it, right? The moment you are trying to pay someone, you are going to pay the thousand satoshi, so you are still ending up with a hundred. And if the fees go a little higher, then you can't even spend it, or you have to combine it with other inputs and. So basically, it's really not in your interest to push this on chain because there is nothing for you to gain by that. Uh, it is expensive for the the uh, arc service provider, and it is expensive for you. Uh, that is that is the base theory of arc. I don't know if it is answers your question. I think you know more or less. Um, I, I don't know. I'm 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 starting to see like that 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 worries me. And then kind of on the flip side of that. Um, you know how easy it is is it to attack an ASP by essentially just splitting up all your VTXOs into just single Satoshi VTXOs. You know, like sending yourself one sat. Yeah. Um, while you know, basically you you lift like a million sats, right? So you got a million sat VTXO, but then you just send yourself one sat VTXO yeah. a million times, and now all of a sudden, you know, your ASP requires yeah, but uh... tons of liquidity. Why? Why it's would? A, why would you do that? Because, why would because you're a, do that? a competing ASP. You're a nation state. I mean, there's all sorts of people. Yeah, that try to no, shut these no. things down. <laughs> everyone, yeah, so everyone's, yeah. everyone's trying to. You use are going point. to. <laughs> you are going to pay about a million satoshi on doing that for the ASP. So that's really good business for him if he can have if he has the liquidity. He is going to make a killing on you doing that, and uh, and and yes, uh, so. Basically, this thing is biased towards uh, larger VTXOs. So if you have a million Satoshi VTXO, you have much better uh, claim on your property rights, uh, much more on-chain enforceable and uh, much more cost-efficient for everyone involved. 
if you have uh, one satoshi utxos uh, vtxos those are going to be relatively expensive to move around compared to what they are worth and um, and that is going to be reflected in the fees that you pay so i i believe again like i said you are bidding for liquidity if you are moving a lot of one satoshi amounts it's going to get expensive maybe someone who is moving a million satoshi is not going to be affected by that because uh, he is ne more near his expiry so it might be expensive for you it might not be expensive for him so this whole thing has a pretty natural uh uh overflow you have a question yeah um i've got a question and statement my statement is uh, first that I, I basically have been looking into ARC and it, the main thing that I see is the programmable layers on top of it. So the contribution that I was bringing is basically having it interoperable with RGB. And I think it, it would be a perfect marriage between the communities, the RGB community and the ARC community to essentially to have the programmable layer of RGB on top of ARC, which is hypothetically possible which would offer more utility for the ARC um, VTXOs. And then my question, my question was, in terms of uh, interoperability, let's say that we have ARC developed on Liquid and then we have ARC on Main Chain. How would the uh, ASPs interact with each other under those circumstances? So, yeah. Um... That's uh, layer that's four, baby. Good job. That's too interesting <laughs> thing. So, so uh, um, I don't know if you heard about Enigma. It's an idea that has been floated around uh, where uh, we can do a lot of stuff and defer settlement, uh, push to on chain and, and keep a large off chain state and do all sorts of magic and it's all composable. So that looks that looks pretty viable. So probably we can compose Lightning and we can compose uh, various uh, Enigma stuff uh, um, above and below uh, the Arc service uh, uh, providers, and and uh, that we know for sure it would work. Um, uh, if if you can do client side validation protocols that still carry some commitment on chain. And you can somehow do this in a blinded key swap, coin join like thing. I have more doubts about that. I, I actually did not look into it, so I don't want to talk uh, like an authority on this matter. I'm just saying that I see some potential for a huge failure because ARC is basically a giant coin join and you are not supposed to be able to track these things. And uh, all, these, uh, all, all this stuff is uh, relying on you being able to track these commitments on chain as far as I know. But like, again, disclaimer, I don't actually uh, know if this will work or not. I just have doubts. And about the, the cross-chain swap. So basically, if you have an ASP on, on Liquid and you have an ASP on main chain, then they can most easily uh, swap between each other or, or move funds between each other over Lightning. That's one possibility. You can have an ASP that maintains presence on both chains. Uh, so, so you can have uh, something that uh, has a near or below dust amounts on liquid and has the larger VTXOs on main chain. Uh, it's the same ASP, the same LSP. And in that case, uh, people can just shift between you know, uh, main chain and, and, and liquid. <clears throat> and the way you do that is uh, you are probably going to have some uh, some overlap between the denominations that are uh, allowed in, in those pools. And uh, that overlap is going to be where you are doing cross-chain swaps. So basically you are going to do cross-chain swaps on these uh, VTXOs. And once these cross-chain swaps settle, so they are enforceable on chain, uh, basically nobody's interested in pushing them on chain. They, they can just be you know, swiped. Uh, when the, the pool transaction matures. And that is how I imagine it, it would really work uh, if, 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 uh, if such a thing was attempted. So... Uh, um, can, can... Do, you, do, do you see any benefits of utilizing hosted channels 
as a bridge between the the two networks and then utilizing lightning to go between one and the other yeah i i, I think uh, i think possibly so you know that since uh, since uh, arc vtxos are uh, uh, the transaction ids are non malleable they they have to work that way uh, you can actually just uh, from that uh, two of two uh, music with the service provider, you can you can basically fund the lightning channel. Probably uh, you can you can attach an H HTLC to it, a PTLC um, stuff like that. So you can have atomic swaps with other chains. You can have atomic payments uh, on lightning. And all kinds of things are possible, and this all can be, you know, rolled back up when, when you are done, when you are fully done spending a VTXO. Uh, you can actually just simply sign it over to the ASP. So I, I think all sorts of things are, are really possible. Uh, the way ARC works, it really opens up a lot. And uh, I think uh, you generally don't need, so as an end user, you don't need this hosting channel stuff um, all that much because uh, you are you are atomic with the, the ARC service provider paying on liquid, uh, on Lightning on your behalf. So you are atomic with that when you pay with the Zcash tokens, uh, virtual UTXOs really. Uh, so, uh, it's it's probably not going to be all that necessary for you to have proper lightning channels, but absolutely doable. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how you get into ARC and how you get out of ARC and what you can do, shall we? So that, that seems like a, a good uh, place to start with that. Exactly, go ahead. All right, so, so let's start with how you get into ARC. In the simplest way, uh, let's assume you are not getting into ARC from lightning or, or something else. So the simplest way is that you are you are on chain. Let's say you have a, a million and a hundred satoshi and some change on chain, and you want this million and a hundred satoshi to be lifted up to ARC. So what will happen is you are going to get ten pieces of hundred thousand satoshis and one piece of hundred satoshi with the XO. That that's what you want to have in the next ARC pool transaction. And uh, basically, uh, you are going to have multiple public keys uh, that, that are uh, tied to these VTXOs. And uh, let's not get into how our uh, key generation works. In the simplest case, you're just simply handing over these public keys with the amounts to the ARC service provider and telling him, listen, I want to have uh, VTXOs that I can uh, unlock spend with these keys. And, uh, and if, if you do that, then I will send, uh, you know, uh, from this uh, transaction output, this, this UTXO that I have, I will, I will uh, give you X amount in fees and I will, I will give you the, the million and hundred uh, Satoshis. And uh, basically the ARC service provider is going to construct a PSBT. So everyone that wants to get in, his own money that goes into it is, are going to be the inputs of this PSBT. And uh, the outputs are going to be always three outputs or three or four outputs. The first is the, the output that, uh, that uh, goes into the VTXOs as a covenant settlement tree. So that's a single output on chain, but it, it, it blooms out. If, if every transaction is put on chain, it blooms out into all the VTXOs that are put into this uh, transaction. <clears throat> and this is uh, basically, uh, uh, this is basically done in a way where you already know the, the future transaction IDs if this, if this gets pushed on chain. And uh, that's one output this transaction is going to have. <clears throat> and this is the once every five second. Uh, yeah, but that's actually not set in stone. So uh, we are just talking about the next candidate for uh, an ARC pool uh, transaction, right? So, so it, it can be 10 minutes, it can be 5 minutes, it can be 5 seconds, it doesn't matter. It's going, it, it going to come into existence. <clears throat> and uh, what happens is uh, you have the on-chain funds, it's going to be an input in this PSBT. 
<clears throat> let's say two other guys have uh, inputs that they want to leave, uh, get lifted up, they all get added to the PSBT. And uh, the ASP is going to show them that, listen, there is this covenant T3. If this transaction with this ID is, is getting to on-chain, if it gets funded, it gets, gets on-chain, then you will be able to claim with this series of transactions your 1 million Satoshis, 1 million and 100 Satoshis. And I will pay it for you uh, with the fees and whatnot. And, uh, and this is how it looks like. Uh, he can he can show this to you. Your your wallet is verifying everything. Your open source wallet is verifying everything. And you say, all right. So if I actually send money to this transaction output and it hits on chain, then I'm going to get this VTXOs. That looks fine to me. I'm signing signing my input. So on this PSBT, I'm signing my own input. What this means is. This signature is going to commit into, you know, probably with C cache all, it's going to commit to all the inputs and all the outputs. That means the, the ASP can take your, your signature and just use it for something else, right? It either, either this transaction hits on chain or your funds are remaining in your custody. There is no other way this can go. It is atomic. And after everyone who wants to get uplifted signs their inputs, the, the ARC service provider is going to sign his own input. And uh, then uh, he can broadcast, uh, he can put uh, this into the mempool. Wicked? Yeah, so the ASP is constructing this transact and, uh, transaction and trying to coordinate, you know, all these people trying to get uplifted. What happens if, you know, one person fails to sign in that five second window uh, computationally? Like, does the ASP just kind of kick them out of that pool and then maybe bring them into the next one if they sign after the window? Probably. Okay. So like that, that, that probably, be a problem. probably. Uh, yeah. So, so I think, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, going to be a lot of situations where you won't have a new, a new pool transaction every five seconds. One possible situation is that there's no economic demand. So let's say the, the ARC uh, service provider is just starting and uh, people are offering fees to get into this next uh, uh, pool, but the fees are not enough to cover the on-chain operation and the ARC service providers, uh, you know, price for the liquidity and whatever. Just not, the, the, the fees offered in this pot are just not enough. So he's waiting. He's waiting for more operations, for more people, right? And we are not getting a, a new pool transaction every five seconds. The other possibility is if, if uh, something like this happens where, where people you know, fail to, to uh, sign. By the way, you can actually, you can actually uh, kind of keep things fluid um, in a way. Um, so you could probably separate uh, pool transactions that uplift people from pool transactions where people are moving be, be, uh, inside the arc a little bit. I mean, uh, if, if you have these uh, lag issues and whatnot, then you can probably do that. But you don't actually want to do that. Um, the, the more people you are coin joining with, of course, this all has limitations as well. So probably going to be a balance between... Uh, taking as many people as we can for a coin join and, and between trying to complete a coin join in a, reason, in a reasonable amount of time, right? So it's going to be some uh, some uh, compromise there. But generally, you want as many participants in a coin join as possible. However, you are not actually gaining any privacy if you are not participating in the coin join with people who have uh, similar uh, VTX amounts. So if, if everyone that wants to, you know, uh, swap VTXOs or, or pay inside the ARC service provider are, are below 1,000 Satoshi VTXOs and you are uplifting 100,000 Satoshi VTXOs and you are the only person that has uplifted, you are not getting any privacy benefits from that coin join, frankly. So, so uh, we, but with a lot of participants, so if you assume that a lot of people are going to be participating in this, thousands of people, and and they all roughly have similar amounts, right? Reasonable amounts for people to have, and 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 move it. Probably uh, you are going to have a pretty good announce set after just like getting in. But you can of course uh, just 
continuously mix uh, as, as the liquidity is available and, and your VTX mature, you are just going to continuously mix uh, with other people. And, uh, and uh, eventually you are going to have uh, an awesome one on set, probably. What about dark pool? Uh, all, all right, uh, let, let, let's, let's finish ARC uh, operations first, I think. So one more question um, regarding the uplifting. So the, the fee paid to uplift your, your input, right, your UTXO, um, would that be a fee paid by the user who's trying to get uplifted? So they'd just be paying for kind of the size of yeah. that one input? Or I, I I believe so. Or, or, or could so, it, or could so you it, or would could have to. You would have to by like everyone kind of in the ASP already. I mean, if there's like a million people <laughs> transacting in the ASP and that's so cool, I mean, you know, maybe it could be subsidized. I mean, why 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 would you pay? Why would you pay for someone else's operation? But yes, so if if enough fees are offered, so let's say a lot more fees are offered than than what it takes to actually put this transaction, then the the ARC service provider may choose to, uh, you know, ask less for uplifting people. I don't know. So, so we will see probably a multi-year evolution where people are just trying strategies. Uh, same with Lightning. So it's hard to predict with 100% certainty. I can only talk about what, what they could do or what they couldn't likely do. But yes, it's, it's possible that everyone will have to pay for that input invite uh, as a basis and, and then some for the uh, the, the mixing and, and stuff or or um, or maybe it uh, getting uplifted is going to be subsidized somehow because you know the arc service provider wants to grow let's say that's that's his uh, thing he wants to be the biggest because the biggest gathers the more fees long term and, and it's just good for business and it's more efficient and it's more desirable maybe so a lot of things are possible. The point is, all the fees of our total are uh, going to have to cover this on-chain cost and, and, and the, the liquidity premium for the ARC service provider. That's, that's really the only rule, unless he is willing to, like I said, subsidize it for a while, in which case uh, he might be pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty altruistic, seemingly. So we have the uplifting covered. I think everyone understands now that uh, how uplifting is atomic and trustless. So the, the getting out is similar. So let's say you have a VTXO uh, and uh, we, we need to talk about uh, then how the TX lock works. The, 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 the heart and soul of ARC is the TX lock mechanism. That's a new lock type that Burak uh, um, uh, invented. Burak is a, is a, a, a real Bitcoin wizard. He is very deep in the Covenant stuff. And uh, he has done, done some awesome and amazing things on Liquid before uh, trying to solve this issue with lightning, lightning for everyone. And so he, he tried to solve the hub and spoke uh, layout uh, you know, trustless, uh, atomic uh, swap thingy with a, a central coordinator. Uh, and the way he did this uh, is by first ensuring that the transaction IDs are predictable to the VTXOs. And by the way, I just want to, I don't want to dwell too much on it. I just want to tell people that I actually think that APO as was tooted before, as a possible way to do this is not going to be able to do this. So anyone that wants uh, or to use any out is going to be sorely disappointed. Um, uh, the more I talk about this with people, the more sure I am that it's just not going to work for ARC. We need uh, the transaction IDs to be predictable and uh, but we do once we have the VTXO. So in our head, it, it does not really have to hit on chain, but in our head, we know the transaction out, uh, ID of this uh, VTXO and, and the out point that will be on chain. Um, once we know that, we can, we can uh, sign a transaction. It has a spend pot where the ARC service provider and the one who holds the key 
the, the owner of that VTXO can collaboratively sign a transaction. And this is what we, we call an ATLC, an Encore Time Lock contract. Uh, there is a bit of a confusion in the, in the public discussion what an Encore is. If we want to, we can define uh, the root transaction in a covenant tree, the Encore, the one that, that ties it to on-chain. and Anchor? Anchor? Anchor, yes. Uh, so Anchor uh, transactions uh, can be defined as these root transactions that get committed to on-chain. And the Anchor time lock contract is uh, basically tying uh, this, uh, this uh, new transaction output to the existence of an anchor transaction on chain. So it, it is only possible to execute this contract if, uh, if an other transaction is going to be on chain. And what happens, like I said, three outputs uh, are going to be present in your average uh, ARC transaction pool. The first one was the VTXO output. The second one is the connector output, the connectors output. And the connectors out uh, are just tiny, tiny, uh, UTXOs that can that are barely you know larger than the dust amount. They don't really carry financial value. Their value is in in them being capable of being pushed on chain, and uh, that means that they are going to have a transaction out point. So they're going to have a transaction ID that is also predictable. And they have and a we are going to chain. excuse me. And they have a size of zero bytes on chain. I mean, it can't be zero because we have the dust limit. So, uh, but but uh, have an economic value of zero, practically, or negative, negative economic value because it's just more costly to move than than and collect. I meant the size. The size of the transactions on chain is there's no cost. How big are these transactions? Yeah. How big are these transactions on chain? How many bytes? I mean, it's probably around. Uh, at least around 200, 200 V bytes. And that's, like assuming, that's, that's assuming like there's nobody getting uplifted or uh, exiting. All right, so let's not get uh, that mixed up, please. Uh, let's focus. So we have the VTXO output, we have the connector output, and we have the, the ARC uh, service provider change output. The ARC service provider change output can really be used for one useful thing, and that is to fee bump uh, the pool transaction if needed. So let's say the, the pool transaction was uh, constructed with two low fees, the, the on-chain fee market spikes because someone is issuing a new 10,000 piece NFT collection and he really wants to push that on-chain and the ARC service provider is like, come on, <laughs> come on, I, 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 I need this to, to get confirmed. And so he can use the change output to bump it without changing the transaction ID of everything committed to, you know, in the pool transaction, that works perfectly fine. So I don't want to waste more time on it. And you have these connector outputs that, uh, like I said, don't carry monetary value, but uh, are also deterministic and, and can be pushed on chain. And we are going to take one of these connector outputs, right? We are going to take one of these in this pool transaction that is really not confirmed. It, it just exists in the mempool. And, and we are going to take this transaction ID and, and the index and, and use it as an input for the Encore time lock contract. So when someone tries to spend a VTXO from a previous pool, let's say that pool transaction has been confirmed like 500 blocks ago. And, uh, and, and to spend that and, and get new VTXO in the new pool, you are going to need to sign that uh, virtual transaction output to the the uh, ARC service provider, and then he will give you the new uh, new one in the new block. And the whole thing is tied together, so you don't have to trust the ASP. It's basically, you take this connector transaction as an input, and, uh, and then you cooperatively sign the ATLC, which transfers property rights to the ASP. And what this thing does is actually, since you have the connector transaction as an input, and this connector transaction uh, ID is dependent entirely on that future ARC pool transaction or, or Encore transaction, if you want, exactly verbatim with the same transaction ID hitting on chain. So it cannot change in any way. 
If it changes, all of its children will have different transaction IDs and the connector transaction will not connect to anything and the on-court time lock contract breaks. So that, that is the key, that is the TX lock, uh, that, that, uh, that is the heart and soul of ARC. And that is the most important piece that people need to understand how this works. And uh, it is really simple. So once you, once you understand and internalize it, you understand that it, it is a very, very simple mechanism and it, it guarantees you automicity. So automicity means that either you give up your virtual UTXO in a previous pool and you get a new virtual UTXO in the new pool, either that happens or you maintain ownership of your virtual UTXO in the previous pool. Because if the ASP mollates that transaction ID somehow, then this connector breaks and the encore time lock contract that you signed is null and void. It, it just can't be satisfied. So it basically, by, by uh, double spending his pool uh, transaction, the ASP basically rips up the contract where you signed your previous VTX over to him. Uh, question, yes? I had two things, one quick statement and then a question. So um, responding about the the connector applets having zero bytes on chain effectively, um, I think their, their amortized cost in the pool transaction is zero bytes because you can put a ton of connectors into a single CTV output of the yes. main pool transaction. So their amortized cost is approximately zero. And that's how we get the connectors for everyone. Yeah, but if you have to put them on chain, that is going to cost. So, right, so it'll have to be some kind of a tree so that the person who needs to go on chain can do it. But yes, there are com complications in there, but hopefully in terms of the actual regular operation, when there isn't a, a, a conflict, they're, they're free. Yes. Happy path. happy path is free with zero bytes on chain, right? Happy path. Right, right. Yes. And then the conflict path can get quite expensive because there's going to be some kind of a, a tree a of zero, CTVs right. in there. The CTV gives us that zero byte thing that we haven't had before. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yes, a, yeah. yes, and, and it, it, it gets quite expensive because, uh, you know, uh, you would, uh, so the, the bad thing about uh, having uh, these uh, non-malleable transactions where the take, transaction IDs are non-malleable, the bad thing is you can't really RBF fee bump anything or can't add new inputs to pay the fees with uh, the stuff. And uh, that may actually come with unfortunate consequences to how people are able to actually put this on chain. And the other thing is uh, we are probably going to need package relay for this to work. I just want to mention that without package relay, uh, if uh, the fee estimates are uh, somehow off on these settlement trees, then you are going to have a real problem pushing them on chain in sequence. And uh, the, basically, you don't need immediate confirmation, but you need enough fees that, that your, uh, your transaction has mempool inclusion. So if, if you are not paying with an ancestor predefined enough fees to have mempool inclusion, then, then uh, your transaction is not getting relayed. It might not get to a miner. And this you are, you are not the... This has to do with the standardness of Bitcoin Core relay? Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's just how mempool works, really. So, right. so you are going to eject from your mempool the stuff that pays the lower fee because statistically those are less likely to be included in the next pool right so we assume the miners are picking the high fee transactions prioritizing them of course with out of bound payments this is not actually a guarantee and this actually is making bitcoin and compact block propagation work more problematically so uh, the whole idea of paying miners out of bound is is going to make everything worse about the way uh, Bitcoin works and, and mining works and books are propagated and, and everything. It really is a, uh, an extremely bad idea, uh, uh, but uh, sometimes it might be necessary. So if you cannot RBF and you cannot efficiently pay with a child for the parent, then you are going to need to somehow convince a miner with a lightning payment or, or 
another on chain payment or something you need to bribe the miner to actually prioritize your your um your transactions somehow they used, they used to be miners that would just do zero zero fees all the time um yeah that was a long long time ago i don't know i don't know anyhow the point is um we probably are going to need a mechanism if, if we want bitcoin to work good and and predictable and and people everyone participating have a decent picture of of uh, what is going on we are going to need a mechanism where people can bid uh, bid uh, these fee bumps for transactions without mollating the transaction ids and uh, one thing is uh, that i would like to just briefly mention is jeremy rubin actually made a proposal about this um he called it transaction sponsors and transaction sponsors allow you to to put sponsor transactions in the mempool where you have to name uh, other transaction ids in the mempool that you want to fee bump and they can all go into a block together or this uh, sponsor transaction cannot go into the block so it's atomic you can automatically bid uh, stuff up and that is like a million times better than out of band payments for for mempool inclusion because uh it first of all it allows everyone to to see the same picture it it uh, allows you to to uh simultaneously address the the entire hash rate so if you are paying a specific miner out of bound then you are only addressing his hash rate if you are if you are bribing a 25 percent uh pool then you are only addressing 25% of the hash rate. And you can imagine that if you are paying enough for a 25% miner for mempool inclusion and you are just keep paying uh, other pools uh, the same rate for mempool inclusion, you are actually going to pay more and you are not getting it back. It's not atomic with your transaction getting confirmed. You are paying them and they, they took your money. So the whole thing sucks and it's stupid, really. I, I, that, that's what I want to say about um, out-of-band payments. Sponsors are atomic. It's a good solution, especially for this covenant stuff and, and, and this def deferred uh, confirmation stuff. And we should probably consider it. Uh, but th that is for the future. And uh, like I said, the other approach is uh, using package delay and, and child pay for, pay for parent stuff, but that can get uh, quite inefficient and expensive. Uh, so eventually you are going to have to pay the fees. So everything that you want to confirm, you are going to have to pay the fees, fees for it. And there might be cases where child pays for parent is the most efficient. So um, I just wanted to mention this because the way you put the connector transactions on chain is, uh, is probably going to be, um, for this reason, the connector transactions are going to have to carry some value uh, that you can, you can pay into fees uh, to have this whole uh, chain, you know, pushed on chain. Uh, and that, again, only works if we have, uh, like, uh, only really works if we have package delay. All right, so, so the point is where we came from is, you have the connector transactions in the new pool. You have the ATSs in the old pool, and they are connected with this TX lock mechanism. Anyone has questions about this? No questions. I think we're good. All right. So, so we understand that we can pay atomically into a new pool that is not even confirmed. Uh, we understand the automaticity of this payment, this internal payment. Now let's talk about getting out. So we want to get out. I, I have uh, a million Satoshi uh, in and, and some change in VTXOs in an ARC pool, and I want to open my own Lightning channel. So let's say I negotiated uh, how this contract would look like with uh, my future channel partner. I have... Uh, have basically uh, an address that I need to fund, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I I tell this uh, I tell this to the ASP that I want to send a million satoshis to that, and he is going to say, "All right, give me give me one million satoshis in VTXOs, like of, offer me VTXOs in one million satoshis." 
you are selecting your virtual uh, transaction outputs and you are you are telling the the arc service provider that I want to uh, want to offer this and this and this and he says all right i'm going to put this output into the next uh, arc transaction pool so i'm going it's not just going to have the vtx output and the connector output and the change output it's actually going to have a new output that is paying this address that i gave him with 1 million satoshis and then uh, he is going to make me sign these a uh, encore time lock contracts uh, for these virtual utxos and uh, you know once once i did actually sign them he will uh, he will uh, put the final single sig on that uh, again that that psbt that he has been building and then it becomes you know on chain enforceable the whole thing i i gave up my uh, virtual UTXOs, I get a real UTXO. And it's basically very, very cheap. It just adds another output to the, to the new pool transaction. And uh, in this case, I am, uh, I am not on the receiving end in the, in the uh, coin join and, and might not even be uh, participating in a coin join specifically with this virtual UTXOs, I believe. So, uh, Someone wants to come up. Nesky. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions about getting in and out or, or internal transfers, maybe? So, a quick question. This is not like, you know, receiving an invoice. You simply uh, give the ASP a, an on chain address. Yeah, this is this is just going on chain. So if, if you actually want to pay a lightning transaction, you can do that, that the the ASP attaches an HTLC. So he can attach an HTLC directly to the to the arc uh, um, pool, or he can attach it in a tree the same way that he attaches VTXs and connectors. So we cannot touch an HTLC that is going to be satisfied or, or, or spendable uh, to him with the same pre-image that the invoice that you want to pay has. So when you, when you get an invoice, you are going to see a payment hash in it and you can construct an HTLC with that payment hash. And the org service provider is only going to get the, the secret for that hash if he pays the invoice if the payment goes through and, and he pays the invoice. So you are basically ensuring that this HTSC is only, only going to him and not you if he pays the invoice. And that is how a payment to Lightning can be atomic. But there's no invoices in ARC. I mean, you can pay invoices. Uh, in in Arc, you don't have invoices necessarily. So if you if you want to pay me in Arc, I'm just going to give you a, a, basically a public key. Is Arc so orthogonal I'm, to is Arc orthogonal to Lightning? I mean, it depends, right? Like I said, it depends how people are using it. If you are just using Arc, if you forget about Lightning for a moment, then I am just giving you a, a public key. And what you are doing is, if you want to send me three VTXOs, let's say, you want to send me in a coin join three VTXOs, you are going to derive three pub keys for me in, from that one pub key. So you are going to, to um, tweak this pub key into three new pubs. And then you are going to let me know that you have actually paid uh, these new VTXOs. You have, you have, you have, uh, you have uh, swapped your VTX was over to these keys and those keys only I can generate the private key for. From my uh, primary private key that belongs to my address, I can generate the private keys. You can generate the private keys for that. You can only generate my public keys, uh, my receiving public keys. And that's uh, kind of how you pay me in ARC if you, if you want to transfer to me in ARC. It does not involve Lightning or HTLCs or anything. All right. Uh, so, do we do we need to 
cover something else in the basic operation of work and how, how this thing works and how it is atomic? Uh, I guess if you want to, as a recap or just a, an overview, what would be the experience of, let's say, a, a store or a business that wants to try, you know, receive payments from customers uh, using ARC? Uh, yeah, that uh, that really depends. I mean, as as a, as someone who just accepts Bitcoin payments, the simplest thing for you would be to just accept Lightning to create Lightning invoices to be paid. That that would be your main thing probably. So that would be the primary means. In a, in a world, if you imagine a world where Bitcoin really is the the, the dominant payment method and, and widely accepted at least um, you can just uh, going to generate a, a, an invoice and uh, they are going to as I described they are going to cooperate with the ESP and the ESP is going to pay that invoice through his uh, lightning node and uh, and uh, people are just going to give up uh, virtual transaction outputs uh, for for uh, to these new encore time lock contracts uh, that they are signing. The, so the user experience is kind of like how you use a custody or lightning wallet. So you are not aware of channels, you are not aware of balances and, and any such bullshit. You, you basically see that you have a million and a hundred Satoshi in this ARC wallet. That's what you see. You will see warnings about uh, if, if you are getting near expiry or something like that. Uh, maybe you will see um, maybe you can you can see uh, stuff like uh, your your active HTS is in a separate balance, balance or whatever, but uh, basically you are just seeing a, a unified balance of a million and a hundred satoshi, and and you are you are seeing a QR code with a Lightning invoice, and you are scanning that QR code, and then your wallet asks you if you want to pay this 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 uh, let's say hundred satoshi. Uh, uh, invoice, and if you say yes, then the negotiation by the wallet and uh, between the wallet and the ASP begins on how you will settle, how you will pay, pay the fees to the ASP, uh, what will those fees be, and and how this will look like, and then you can just say yes, I accept, or no, I don't, I don't want to pay. I, I will pay some other ways. Yes, we can. Yeah. So I mean, I I'm still thinking that our will most likely not be used for payments. I mean, especially smaller ones, right? If you're making payments, you're probably just going to be using a custodial mint or like you'll have some, some lightning channels open to, you know, a, a, a lightning hub, right? Because I mean, how, how is the, well, so, go ahead. When you say payments, are you talking about consumer? Yeah, consumer. I mean, Cause producer? we're talking about a business accepting payments, right? And so no one's going to be sitting around waiting yeah. for five seconds, you know, for the next <laughs> pool transaction. People aren't going to want to pay the fees associated with using, you know, ARC for every single payment they make. They want something that happens instantly and cheap. And so they're probably going to want to use mints or custodial lightning wallets is my assumption. I mean, that's just yeah. what we've seen already. So... So it's it's possible that some people will use uh, you know custodial uh, chamia means, which by the way uh, would work very similarly UX wise. And as you said, they are going to be probably cheaper because the li liquidity requirements is cheaper. But in return, you you are you are giving up a lot. Yeah. So it, it, it's up to the people. But uh, I mean, one one thing I've been maintaining your own. Sorry, one thing I've been thinking about is like, you know, ARC, uh, it's it's trustless, but it's permissioned, right? But then cash humans are like, you know, permissionless, but trusted. So you kind of have like the opposite trade-offs in both. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's not, so ARC is not more permissioned than than eCash. I, I wouldn't same, say that it's I guess. true. I, it, about the yeah, same. Yeah, because they could both, so, I guess. Yeah. You, Restrict you from spending yeah, if you so want. You, it, yes. So I, I believe uh, the way eCash works, the, the main thing about eCash is you do not have a balance, uh, an account with a balance. So you, you are not identifiable as a person 
that is a big thing why people consider it more permissionless than uh, the account system. So you have you have privacy, and with that comes that he basically can just deny service to everyone and not you specifically. That's a big thing, and this is true for Arc as well. So exact same dynamic you have. Um, the only only difference I can see is as you said. Uh, probably the ARC service provider is going to have to charge higher fees uh, in total. But these fees are going to be divided to a lot of people. So, so the, really, the, the ASPs are going to be huge. And, uh, and uh, again, depends on the velocity of the money, really. So there could be periods when the fees are really high, when the ASP is strapped for liquidity. But in periods where the ASP is uh, pretty liquid, and people don't want to transact so much. Like I said, liquidity is kind of analogous to, to block space in this world. Uh, the fees are going to go down and then you can you can do stuff. And I don't really see like a, a huge difference necessarily. We will see, I guess. So we will see what the difference will be in, in fees that you have to pay for lightning transaction. But uh, I really don't think that ma maintaining your own lightning channel and, and, and managing that channel and paying the own chain fees and, and paying for the liquidity is going to be competitive with ARC. So I think Burak got this right, I believe. So, so people are not going to use probably their own lightning channels for this stuff all that much. Or if they are going to do it, they will do it in a way where these lightning channels are could be lightning channels. So like I said, from a, an ARC VTXO, you can open a lightning channel with the service provider. And, and uh, that basically saves you and the ARC service provider a lot of liquidity and probably fees because you don't need to constantly swap and swap and, and roll these funds over. So you have a channel open and until you have paid the channel uh, towards the, the ASP in full, uh, you are just only paying lightning fees, really. So you have this option, right? You have a lot of options on what you will, but what you will not do is you will not have an on-chain channel and, and you will not pay on-chain fees probably if you can avoid it. And, um, and so I, I really do believe that this wallet is going to be a better experience than any hosted wallet type uh, uh, stuff, you know, where... Where, where you actually have uh, have have a, have an art point on chain that you are paying for and, and liquidity logged into it. As for Chomin eCash, it's it's almost certainly guaranteed that Chomin eCash is going to be cheaper on the face, but you have to price in the 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 potential for getting rugged. So that that is the trade off. And like I said, we Bitcoiners either insist on, on certain stuff, even if it's more expensive, or the world is not going to look the way that he, how we would like it to look. So there is a price for freedom and sovereignty. And if people are not willing to pay it, then it's not going to happen. Talking about trade-offs, uh, what's the CTV trade-off? Um, what do you mean specifically? Um, data availability. Yeah. <sighs> All right. I mean, I'm just mentioning it because it, it is a trade-off, but it's it already yes. exists since since 2017. But yeah. So so uh, basically, all of all of these. Um, again, I, I had this tweet where I I listed uh, what when when you use a blockchain, when you don't use a blockchain, basically is going to be. Uh, if if you need a strict ordering of events, a strict and unambiguous ordering of events, and you need consensus critical data to be available, and you need non-interactivity, then we don't really know how to solve this without the blockchain. So everyone that says blockchains are not good for anything is just plain wrong. Uh, blockchains are do. Uh, are, are, do add some value and, and do cover some use cases, but they don't really scale. So we know this like, like since 2010, really. Some, some people know it since 2010. Some people know it since 2013. Some people know it since 2015. Some people didn't get the memo yet, but blockchains don't really scale. Uh, they, they, they are pretty horrible in a lot of regards. And, uh, and so uh, we are trying to 
to relax these things. So we are trying to give up something. And with CTV, when you when you when you take this uh, this data, this state of chain, you are basically giving up non-interactivity, and you are giving up from data availability. So if you actually lose access to this off-chain data, then you can get stuck. And uh, various constructs have various, uh, you know, ways they can they can fail you. And uh, in, in dark pool, the way I constructed it, I'm especially proud that you have uh, <clears throat> you have a pretty good chance of being able to recover just from a seed. So you have a you have a good chance at standalone recovery, but that still requires other people to have access to the off-chain data and, and eject you on chain. Because if everyone loses the off-chain state, then it's all game over. So, so in, in, in a case where everyone, every participant all lose and, and they can't uh, you know, uh, enforce their property rights, none of them can, then, uh, then everyone uh, loses their coins, basically. It's not like on-chain where you can all, always just scan the, the transaction history with your uh, keys and, and you can find your UTXOs. It's, it's not like that. Uh, there, there are indeed trade-offs in this regard. And, and every time uh, we go, uh, go into this uh, direction of, of taking things off chain, we are going to uh, probably be more interactive. We are going to give up from these uh, capabilities of, of standalone recovery. And, uh, and um, in some cases, uh, we are also giving up, you know, the, the, uh, the strict ordering of events as well. Uh, the unambiguous strict ordering of events uh, may, uh, may also hurt. I, I, I think I... Uh, so I had uh, written some on this server. Uh, I find... Uh, I, I don't agree on this, but UTXOs are... The state of the UTXO set is independent of ordering. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, it yeah. can be, it can be in some cases, but, uh, you know, when you get into double spent territory, that, that is no longer true. So, uh, what I wrote about this is, is, uh, basically when you go Enigma, uh, you give up, like I said, non-interactivity. And uh, with client-side validation, you don't really need consensus critical data availability for everyone. And with JPEGs and other blobs, you, you don't need this uh, ordering of events in any way. Uh, so, so when we want to do a specific use case, uh, we will find often that blockchains are not the best way to do them because we don't need all, all three of these things. But I don't want to waste too much time on uh, debating this issue. This is this is how I think about it, and if you don't like it, you don't like it. So the other trade-off that we have, you know, with uh, on-chain stuff right now. So in in the world where block space is abundant and and uh, and cheap, uh, people can uh, actually hold their own keys in uh, in on-chain UTXOs, and. Uh, I think a lot of people are using hardware wallets probably, so they have an experience with, with how to use uh, hardware wallets. We can go go mountain and all the way, and we can have you know uh, hardware wallets that are completely air gapped and uh, and uh, and only communicate with other software through QR codes and QR codes and and uh, that is just not going to work in in a in a in a future where, where you have these huge off-chain states and these huge off-chain state transitions are, are being signed very cooperatively, you cannot have this user experience anymore. It's just not going to work with, uh, with stuff like Seed Signer and Jade uh, and, and, and uh, I think Foundation devices also. Uh, have this uh, QR code based experience and and uh, that is just not going to work in this world. That is another trade-off that people need to understand that there is a price that we pay for getting off-chain and, and getting more interactive. 
and getting more complicated uh, rules and, and off-chain state. And uh, it will affect uh, sovereignty in ways that some people may not appreciate and, 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 uh, and fully internalize today. Yeah, QR code definitely won't work, although I suspect that uh, NFC would still have just enough bandwidth to do this stuff. Yeah, so, so stuff like, uh, you know, um, where, where you, where you uh, can do uh, music, uh, you know, Schnorr music and Frost uh, and, uh, and stuff like that, uh, those require some connectivity with, between the hardware signing device or, or the signing device or the signer for short and, and uh, some computer that is internet connected. So this whole air gap thing is just not going to be a thing. I believe. Well, me, so we I mean, can... music and frost don't require a connection. There are only two rounds. You can you can go uh, online. But... All, you can just carry it back and forth twice. Yeah, That's but these thing. these schemes have all multiple rounds. If if you take a look at it, so <laughs> you are negotiating. Right, but, but, but two rounds, two assigned... rounds is easy. Two two right, rounds. I'm building easy. something with a hundred thousand transactions a second. It's yeah, it gets crazier. <laughs> yeah, it gets crazier, and, and and the most important thing is. Uh, today, if you do a transfer, right? So you you have you have a, a, a UTXO and you are creating two UTXOs, one change, one uh, what you want to spend. It's pretty easy to review that transaction on a signing device. It's, it's like three lines. Maybe you are going to go through multiple screens to get it visualized. Everyone's seen how the hardware wallets are doing this. It's very cool and everything. Uh, I mean, try do it with a huge off-chain state where you have thousands of VTXOs in a tree. And, and uh, so it, it's just impossible, humanly impossible to review it. And if you don't review it, then how would the hardware device know that you are not getting screwed? So uh, these, these are the things that we're just going to have to figure out. I, I, I told people before, and I, I'm saying it again, there is going to be a price for off-chain scaling um, that... Some people don't appreciate yet, but I think these are going to be interesting technical challenges. So I don't want to bring everyone down. I think it's a, a new frontier. We should explore it and go as far as we can, push as far as we can within the current limitations. That's my way of approaching this. And we should be bored, really, and not uh, fearful about this. I think Oflo has his hand up. Please. Oh, actually, I didn't realize I had my hand up. Excuse me. All right. So what else can we tell about the trade-offs? Anyone can, has can any? We, can we jump back? Uh, it's something that's being discussed over on the ARC Telegram group. Um, the ability of the ASP to actually collect all of the, um, the, the, the signatures paying all of the input VTXOs to the ASP in order to form each coin join round. Um, it seems like there's going to be a, a, a liveness problem here where, where a single participant going who wants to send into the next round uh, going offline could block the next round from being able to execute. And I'm wondering if, if anybody yeah. has had any thoughts about how to solve that. Yeah, we, we are going to have a lot of these, uh, these coordination and timing difficulties. I think because, it's going to uh, be Zoom, maybe? What was that, Jay? I think it's going to have to be person to person until we get it working, right? Like it used to be. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the uh, problem is that the ASP has to get signatures on every... Yes. Everybody who's transferring into the next coin join round, they have to get a signature with the connector in. Yeah, but we're all, we're all ASPs. It's just software. Anyone could be an ASP. But, but our uh, works best with few large ASPs. So we're going to be yes. looking at a large ASP trying to collect hundreds or thousands of signatures going into a coin join round. Yes. Um, and so like for, for Frost, they've designed Roast to kind of give us somewhat of a liveness guarantee. And I, I think we're going to have to design a similar robustness protocol so that the 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 ASP proposes many p potential coin joins and gets signatures on all that are acceptable to a very to from many different people and then whatever the largest one that gets all the signatures for it actually posts and then it pushes everyone else to the next round or yeah. something like that. All right, so, is, yeah. Give up control no, for three seconds. 
Now I remember. So I did have a question, but it was so long that I forgot I had a question. So my my question was this. We we have a problem in ARC that basically every four weeks, ARC service providers can sweep all the wallets of the users and essentially take their funds. So what can we what can we do to solution that to have the equivalent of let's say a watchtower in lightning but within arc you can so i mean what what you could do is you could have the asp just i mean this would be on the asp obviously and it would be trusted but the asp could roll over the vtxo and just send it back to the same address as the previous vtxo yes. right oh it's deterministic so anyone could do anything that's the difference. Yeah, and it, and it's trusted. You don't yes. have to wait until the end. And it's trusted, you know, obviously for that moment in time when the when yes. the ASP, you know, technically could sweep it if they wanted. And then the other thing that they could do, and this is the part that I kind of, I mean, I, I imagine an ASP will have kind of like its own mint stood up next to it. And what if they just, you know, sweep it and then they give you an e cash balance in that mint until you come back online? Yeah, but uh, you don't actually need to. So at the moment. The moment the ESP swap the funds, you have something that is the equivalent of an e-cash note. Basically, you can always prove to the ESP that he swapped your funds, and you did not. Uh, you know, uh, you you have access to the key, and and you did not claim it. So you already automatically have an e-cash note in that case, and he can choose to honor that and and give you give you you know. Uh, uh, a VTXO again in return. And as you said, yes, to the same key, he can automatically roll you over. Uh, that is possible. And um, that's, but there's, there's that's... basically like no guarantee that you'd get you'd get the money back, right? This becomes completely up to the VTXO, uh, up to um, up to the ASP to owner, right? Exactly. So the the moment that you are not getting uh, swapped over in time. And by the way, so if you push your VTX on chain or, or gets pushed on chain by someone else because you are a sibling to someone who, who wanted to get out, then you get pushed to on chain for free, basically. I mean, it all depends on who who who, do, who wants to what if this is a good thing or a bad thing. But let's say your VTXO is there. So you can only spend that VTXO after a day. So the ASP has one day to, to push an ATLC on chain signed by you to enforce his property right to that uh, VTXO. If you already spent it and you are trying to double spend him, so the ASP needs protection from you. you it's always a two way street. People tend to think of it from the user perspective, but uh, you also need to think of oh. from the. Okay, hey, so I just want to make sure, right? So, so you're saying that if I, as a user, I want to, use, I want to unilaterally exit, I can wait for four weeks until the ASP uh, unfolds the transaction and then I have uh, 24 hours to no. um, to get my money. Okay, go ahead, sir. No, sorry. So what I'm trying to say, you can't wait for four weeks because if you wait for four weeks, then you don't have, uh, after you push your VTX on chain, you don't have a whole day. So the, the ASP is going to be able to swipe the funds before, before your time lock, your relative time lock expires. And uh, so what really happens is you have to, you have to at least like two days before the deadline, you, you need to start seriously thinking about uh, pushing your VTX on chain if the ASP is not cooperating. So, so then you are really racing the clock uh, because, because uh, I, I mean, like, again, depends on how much you can trust the, the ASP and, and how nice he is. But probably if the ASP is not, not automatically, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, rolling you over. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's a risk to him. I, I, I would say the ASP is only going to roll you over automatically if you are in this last one day period, because then you can't actually raise him. You, you so relative, him. Rel yeah, your UTXO is relative value 1% of his UTXO and you're playing the same game. So he's in a bad position from, from the get-go. What do you mean? The user against the ASP. The user has yeah. all these. He's able to manipulate massive stuff with a small value already. So I, I, most of the tech, it, it's already in their 
favor the user? I don't know. I, I think if, if it's properly set up and properly uh, gamed out, then, then everybody will lose on not being cooperative. I think that is the only way ARC is going to work at scale. If, if not cooperating means that everyone is losing, that is going to be a pretty, pretty uh, strong motivation for people to play nice. Um, anyhow, I just said that the ASP can't actually roll you over before the last one day because then you can actually try to raise him and double spend him. But, um, but uh, most likely that act is going to cost you more than your low value VTXO. So this is only a thing for large value VTXOs. The, the ASP is always going to be able to have a you know, discretion over what uh, amounts uh, are handled how. And, and this is going to be probably an organic evolution. So maybe some ASPs are going to be nice and then they are going to get double spent or something and they stop being nice or at least they stop being nice with large values, right? So yes, we could... Yeah, I mean, I I don't expect ASPs ever to roll over a VTXO if it hasn't already expired. That wouldn't make any sense to me, right? And they'll they're going to wait till they can actually sweep it and then ensure that they can roll it over. Um, however, they choose to do that, I think the risk of double spending would be what? too yeah. too significant. Why why can't that be why can't that be done directly on the the client side within the wallet? Why can't the wallet just automatically so, update based on your yeah. last well, transaction? Of course, a good morning. wallet yeah, would. I was going to say that as but well. But the user got a line once every two weeks. Yeah, I was going to say like, you know, any any good UX, right? A user shouldn't be even thinking about that really, right? Unless they want to. There should be an advanced <laughs> uh, settings that you can go into and yeah. see all you know all the all the time downs or whatever. But yeah, like, uh, most people shouldn't think about it when they when they open the app. It should just automatically roll them over if they're anywhere near the expir expiry. Attach is attached. We attach to a yes. full node. When you attach to a full node on the desktop, you have full everything. Otherwise, you know you're a light wallet. I mean, in this case, it doesn't matter all that much. Because uh, you really are, uh, you you really are only dealing with things that are predetermined to play out in a specific way, and if you are aware of the of the uh, you know the inclusion of of the root uh, put the UTXO, then you pretty much know everything without having to uh, you know look at on chain much. Um, right, you don't care which chain it is, as long as the your connector is valid on the on a chain. Either your thing goes through atomically on the chain you care about, or it doesn't. Either way, you're okay. You you don't actually need to know. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course. So uh, there will be situations where you need awareness of what happened, um, because, for example, if you are not aware that the 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 ASP did something funny and molated. A, a transaction ID or it just didn't get included uh, and you are in the belief that you actually got new VTXOs uh, for your old VTXO instead of you know having to to swap it over on or, or, or claim it uh, when you get near expiry if the, the ASP is not uh, so so yeah there are situations where you do need to have an awareness of, of what is going on on chain and it's probably going to pay to to either run your own node, that is the most trustless way of, of having a chain of uh, having a view of the, the chain state, uh, or, or, or you know, at least uh, connect to some Electrum server or something that is not the ASP, because that, that uh, really messes with, uh, with the game theory for the ASP if you are using him to have a view of the blockchain. So you, you're going to want to. Keep that thing separate. This entire least. thing works because we're using the blockchain as a full node. We should just be full nodes using the blockchain. And we know everything. That's, yeah. That's what we could guarantee. And but, then we could guarantee but, that. And then everything can, else you, we can't guarantee. You can you can uh, run a run a full node and not own any UTXOs, not being able to afford any UTXOs. So that is the future we are doing. Okay. What's gonna... okay. Okay. So, so we are still going to need something where we can collaborate and, and be optimistic about this thing. And uh, if uh, people find a way to 
to profitably mess that up, then it's not going to work. I mean, seriously, if if, if it's going to be uh, profitable to to sabotage an ASP, then they are going to get murdered, slaughtered. That's not going to work. If it's going to cost you money, and these ESPs are like incomparable to most people who want to play with them. Like I said, if, if MicroStrategy is going to have like 100 or 200,000 Bitcoins and and uh, <clears throat> some uh, small coin join operation is trying to to mess them up, uh, it's very likely going to go the other way. So they are going to pay a lot and uh, the ESP is just going to laugh at them. So it, it all depends on the relative economic size, the, the time horizon you have for your return on investment, your strategy for getting new people and, and stuff like that. I, I can't, I'm not a business person. I, 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 I have never built a company, let alone a giant company. Uh, like an exchange or, or some financial institution. I'm just saying that it is possible that people are going to do stuff that we don't actually expect them to do because it, they have a time horizon where that makes actually sense, even if short term it's going to cost them a lot of money. All right. So... Uh, I guess it would be nice uh, to... Um... I actually, actually have a question about multi-party payments in um, yeah in ARC. How, how does that work? Um, multi-party payments? As in people... It's just a normal the Bitcoin person. transaction. Just a normal Bitcoin transaction. It's Bitcoin script. So he wants to pay multiple outputs i mean you can yeah you you can to exit uh, into a convenant you can interpret it in a lot of ways but so yeah you can you can pay multiple outputs you, you can have uh, multiple people paying one output you, you can have you can do all sorts of things. You, you can actually have a multi-party computation for your private key, probably. So you you can have a virtual UTXOs that are only spendable by multiple people cooperating. That is a very likely thing that you can do. So what I said, uh, I, what what we may actually just recap on is uh, is what are the trade-offs between Arc and Lightning, right? I think that is that is one thing that that a lot of people uh, want to understand that what is the motivation behind ARC and and why do we even talk about it? So so uh, as was said, uh, with Lightning, you actually have uh, a, a, a seriously considerable on-chain presence for those that participate that that hold uh, lighting channels you have a constant problem of liquidity the distribution of liquidity the liquidity is not being efficiently allocated so that is the main thing that would have likes to talk about he spent a lot of time about thinking about lighting and how it will be at scale and basically the the inefficient allocation of liquidity and the constant struggle with that and and the the Really, the cost to capital of of placing your liquidity where it's not needed, as opposed to not having the liquidity where it's needed, and uh, the the management uh, costs uh, on chain and and other costs, and uh, and all this stuff is uh, basically uh, completely offloaded to the ASP, which is a professional Lightning node, and. Uh, and the users don't have to deal with that. They really have this eCash, Lightning connected eCash wallet experience at the most part. The main difference is, uh, is that they, it, it is also kind of like the perfect on-chain wallet experience, right? So it, it's, a, it's like if, if, if you kind of married uh, like Monero with Moon Wallet, where, where you, you, you sort of uh, have a 
sort of have an on-chain presence, but not really uh, have an on-chain presence. And you are paying low fees uh, because you are part of a big, big cooperative, uh, minimal on-chain footprint uh, movement, and and you are still uh, able to spend over Lightning. Uh, and and receive over lightning and uh, so so it's it's hard to describe in today's terms because it's a completely new wallet experience that is trying to take the best things about everything so the be- best 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 uh, stuff like uh, you give out an address to other people to send you coins but they never really send to that address so anyone that observes the coin join the ASP they they can't actually tell which uh, virtual UTXOs are going to be yours. They, they can't tell that. And after you spend those VTXOs, after you mix it, uh, the sender can't tell them either who, who sent to you. So uh, the whole thing is uh, is like uh, you have the on chain, uh, off chain, uh, no, offline. You have the offline receive. You have the stat address experience, like uh, with some privacy coins that give you. But you can immediately spend. Like I don't know if anyone used the Monero wallet. Um, you can't actually immediately spend necessarily your funds. Uh, you have to wait. I don't know how many minutes. And um, and that is uh, like uh, for them to ensure that you have a better privacy, uh, <clears throat> better on one set uh, for your transaction stuff like that. And. Uh, and you don't have that here. If you receive funds, you can immediately spend them. You can immediately pay a lightning invoice. Mm. It's, it's a pretty good wallet experience. And the only thing we don't know is how costly it will be for the end users. And the answer to that is we really don't know unless we try. So unless we try to make this work, we are not going to be able to figure out uh, if this is competitive uh, for what it does, uh, you know, fee-wise. But we know that if there are a lot of participants, then the costs are going to be distributed between them. And that is probably in the favor of ARC. Yes, we could. Uh, let's go to Blob. He had his, or they had their hands up first. I don't know. I, I had a quick question, and it was explained why sort of like the wallet of Satoshi or MicroStrategies might make a big better arc than somebody that has, you know, half a Bitcoin. But can you explain again why an arc needs to be big and that why people will prefer big arcs versus okay. small ones? Oh, so one of the main reasons, uh, ju- just if, if you are a user, right, uh, you can choose to be in a, like I said, a, a half Bitcoin small, let's say Chomini cash mint. Uh, where the total announce set is five people. Um, and uh, that is not a very good announce set. Or you can choose to be in, a, in a, a, a giant operation where millions of people are participating in and, and, uh, and you, your, uh, your notes, your recash notes are going to be in that huge swimming pool. So you immediately, immediately gain more privacy. Uh, probably a large operation can secure the coins better. Like banks really do economy of scale for security uh, when, when you are talking about custodying funds. So you will you can play the name of be your own bank, but you are never going to have the security that the bank actually has. Like not in a billion years. You are not, not going to be able to offer that, that security. That's just not possible. So, so large operations have this uh, economy of scale for security. They have, uh, they, they, they have a larger on set. Uh, they have better liquidity, probably are going to be able to offer you uh, cheaper services because everyone, needs to, everyone who is uh, running a lighting service provider is going to need to incur those costs associated with having on-chain liquidity and managing the channels, whatever. The larger the operation, the more base this is divided. So, so obviously one person has to pay less part of it. The whole thing is, is, is really more efficient. And uh, those, I believe, are the main reasons. Uh, yeah, and also with, uh, you know, ARC, you have this special thing where you have a constant, pretty sizable 
on-chain presence. You 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 have, uh, as someone put it, if you truly can manage five uh, second uh, pools, and I don't actually think this will be possible most of the time, so I have my doubts about that, but the uh, Burak says that five seconds is like some target that you try to achieve and maybe not going to achieve. Um, uh, and, and only if you have enough demand for it. So basically, if that is true, if, uh, if an ARC service provider does five uh, transactions per second, then someone calculated that he's going to fill up three whole blocks uh, each day. Uh, and we have like 144 blocks each day. And if a single ARC service provider is going to pick up three blocks, then we can see that kind of the number of ARC service providers is uh, seemingly limited. Now, here comes Enigma, of course. So if, if you use CTV in a more smart way, and unfortunately, the end user is probably going to have barely anything to do with it. Uh, so the, the coordination difficulties uh, wholly, wholly placed on the ARC service providers. They can actually place uh, themselves under a CTV distribution tree where they have an N of M multi-sig uh, uh, four-week time log span pot and have an alternate covenant distribution that, that can be driven by either one of them or any of their users. So you can get to a pool transaction the same way that you would get from a pool transaction to a VTXO. As a, this is the turtles all the way down uh, scenario. So you can actually put like say 100 ASPs into a single UTXO on chain uh, that, that this is the power of CTV. But this always comes back to that, all right, but if you do that, then you are going to add like two additional uh, UTXOs that needs to be put on, put on chain. And um, so this probably is going to reach some equilibrium. Like people are only going to do this if it's, uh, if it's economically sensible, I guess, because if our service providers take off enough, uh, you know, uh, enough uh, on-chain activity uh, to off-chain, that which part, is has... which part is Enigma? Uh, so, as I like to say, Enigma is everything people don't understand about CTV and how it can be applied. Another way to say it is uh, the the uh, other way to put it is. Uh, you know, if uh, if CTV is like mathematics, then Enigma is like physics, applied mathematics. So it, it is it is an imagined behavior of how people will use, uh, you know, CTV or, or a similar covenant. And uh, and uh, these are these are one of the main uh, ways people try to describe it. But uh, really, what Enigma is is you you. You maintain a large off-chain state in cooperation with others, and thus you can you can defer or forego uh, UTXOs to be pushed on chain. Optimistically, you can forego. Uh, worst case, you can defer. Because yeah, so um, you know, I mean, I'm playing the, the the clock forward here a little bit and thinking about kind of the bootstrapping of Arc. Um, I think it's going to it's it's going to naturally happen, um, and the reason why is if we're talking about elevated on-chain fees, um, I mean, this is going to have a natural tendency to push people into Arc out of fear. I mean, you know, people are literally going to get flooded <laughs> out of being able to use their UTXOs. I mean, I'm not using this analogy lightly. Like they will literally drown, and their UTXOs will become unspendable if they aren't uplifted onto Arc. You know, before the fees get so high that they can't spend them, right? I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I, but, uh, come, come on, Let, let's be serious. Let's be serious a little uh -huh. bit. Like, uh, let's say currently we have like 10 million active Bitcoin user stops. So those who are actually interactive with, interactive with the blockchain, we probably have probably less than 10 million, but I think 10 million tops. So we already have the blocks full. If, uh, if we have 20 million, active Bitcoin users, then uh, everyone can just transact half as much on chain and it's going to be more costly, pretty much a, a safe bet. And 20 million people is like a big city. So uh, a giant city on earth is 20 million people. It's nowhere near, uh, you know, global population. 
And uh, we are going to very quickly get to a point in a high adoption future where people are just not going to have any on-chain presence standalone. And uh, what's going to happen is you are buying Bitcoin on an exchange and you are going to transact it off-chain. Either the exchange is going to be interoperable with the R protocol and you are able to send to a, a, a public key, uh, you know, to an ARC service provider, or, or you are going to send over Lightning. So you are going to pay the, the uh, ASP over Lightning to get your VTXOs. But probably this whole step where people are asking to be uplifted is only really going to apply to... All right. Uh, transaction fees are so high. It's simply because there's a bottleneck. In comparison to actual uh, full node operators, you don't have... Um, I'm sorry, in comparison to light wallet users, you don't have so many full node operators. So if there was um, a type of, um, if there was a type of controlled or, 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 or um, verifiable control mechanism on the network to verify who has a miner, and then the only those only those who have a verified full node with a verified miner could could modify the transaction fee between themselves what are you talking about yeah well, yeah i think i think i think um Hmm. Yeah, so, so basically, <laughs> basically on any distributed I, on any distributed network you have uh, protocols. So if you had a protocol, for example, to have like a proof of miner or a verified MAC, a, 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 a verified virtual MAC address, uh, a, a bottleneck, bottleneck, yes, bottleneck. Yeah, the bottle, the bottleneck, yeah. because a lot, the light right. users it's, are not it's built in. It's built into the software and the number of bytes per block. We we actually built it in. That's kind of the deal. All right, guys, I'm trying. To, to sort of keep the conversation focused. Uh, let's not get distracted. Um, so I'm going to get back to Moon. And basically, uh, so he was basically wrapping it up, uh, summarizing what we discussed. And then I'm going to also ask a final question. What is, it, what, what is the state of development on ARC? Any kind of, uh, you know, BIPs being prepared to propose that sort of thing where, where do we stand, all right. stand there all right so so yeah maybe just very briefly uh, i would like to mention that burak uh, wanted to or, or maybe thought to mainly propose arc uh, to be implemented with apo um arc arc can possibly be implemented uh, without any soft fork change so there is a way to do it. It's going to it's going to be painful for the developers. It's going to be painful for the reviewers. It's going to be painful for the users because if we were talking about that. Just the coordination difficulty of these uh, these uh, two of two uh, uh, like uh, between the ASP and between the user who wants to transact just. The coordination difficulty of doing those in parallel, uh, you know, uh, to to reach consensus, sort of uh, on a new arc pool transaction uh, that can hit on chain, that is going to already be a lot, and people already have doubts about the viability of them. So there are there have been doubts expressed to how well that would scale already. And then you can multiply that by a thousand, basically, if you are doing these large. Uh, music uh, collaborative signing things where you are supplementing a simple covenant where the ASP can can just uh, assemble these structures in a trustless manner and 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 everyone can be sure that if this if this address gets funded with this amount then we know the transaction IDs that fall out of it because the, there is really no other way for that to happen. Instead, we have to sign collaboratively from the, the, the leaves up to the root. 
And that is going to be a lot of signing operations where you have these synchronization points and multiple, multiple phase uh, signings. And it's going to make everything like a thousand, a 10,000, a million times worse than if we had a covenant. So like I said, if people have doubts about how this will work uh, in the best case, then I would say it's almost, almost impossible for it to work at scale in, in the worst case. So I, I guess most people assume that we are going to have package relay and we are going to have a covenant preventive uh, for R2 to really work at scale. But to implement it as a prototype, you can probably just um, you know, hand wave this problem away not exist on the five second intervals, go for like 10 minute intervals or whatever, and, and uh, just try uh, to manage these cooperative signing sciences somehow. And uh, you, can, you can probably do it. But again, this is a lot of wasted work in my opinion. So, so we can technically do it, but it's just not going to be good. And it's going to be unnecessarily complicated. So I would say uh, ARC does need a soft fork uh, to be good and, and, and to be a real, real game changer or, or potential real game changer in, in, in how we interact with Bitcoin and what is the wallet experience of people. And uh, mainly Burak uh, proposed it with any prevout. Any prevout is a new, new way to do, uh, to calculate the SIG hash. Uh, SIG hash is like I mentioned, you have a transaction, uh, you are picking parts of the transaction that are relevant and you are making a SHA-256 hash of those parts, and then you are signing that. So, so you are that signing that that is your message. <clears throat> and the verification the nodes do is they are going to take the same uh, pre-image, they are going to calculate, they are going to check the signature against that message. And if everything checks out, your transaction is valid. That is how Bitcoin works. And uh, APO is a... Uh, is, is, uh, started as uh, Cash no input. Cash no input uh, didn't want to, uh, you know, in include the inputs, only commit to the outputs. That was the original simple proposal. Uh, it was really changed a lot to, to accommodate certain use cases and to be more friendly with Taproot. And that is how we ended up with any prevout. Uh, any prevout uh, and any prevout, any script really are two uh, different uh, hashes slightly different caches. And uh, this is right now active on the Inquisition uh, signet. So anyone who wants to try out uh, any prevout can actually uh, play with it on that signet. Uh, and uh, CTV is also active on that signet. So CTV can also be tried out. Basically, we could develop client software right now that is using these primitives and we can test them. So these, these changes are really ready to be merged. And uh, like I said, Burak wanted to, because there was this saying, uh, there have been a debate going on for years, a debate uh, about, uh, uh, you know, city versus APO and what should we want and how should we want, and people have different ideas about it. But there was, there was an understanding that APO can, can largely emulate CTV. And uh, that somehow mutated into people thinking that APO can actually emulate CTV. And that is also a blanket statement is not true. And so, like I said, Burak wanted to, to use APO. He thought that had a wider consensus, a wider support among developers. The reason for this is uh, related to Lightning. So uh, a lot of people wanted uh, 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 something called L2 for Lightning because Lightning nodes have to keep uh, the whole, whole channel state history uh, since uh, you know the, the, the funding of that Lightning channel. And if a Lightning channel had like 20,000 uh, commitment transaction updates, then it's going to be uh, all that is going to be stored by the node because you never know what old state someone tries to push on chain. And it's, it's making uh, watchtowers more costly, it's making nodes more costly and more failure prone. And um, L2 basically allows you to only keep the, the latest channel state. So uh, a lot of people like that, but uh, L2 also foregoes the penalty mechanism inherent in Lightning's game theory, where someone trying to you know, uh, 
broadcast on our channel state can be punished and can can his balance taken from him l2 removes that l2 simply allows you to always push a, a later uh, state uh, always overwrite uh, in in the time lock period an, an older state with a newer state and basically that means that uh, no penalty mechanism is built in or, or required it's a different channel construction apo gives you that channel construction CTV alone does not give you the channel construction, but uh, as we see with ARC, uh, it is a strong suspicion and some people already confirmed it, or at least soft confirmed it, that APO cannot actually do ARC. So it does not give anything positive to ARC. Uh, with APO, if you want to keep things trustless, you are going to have the same interactivity as without APO, basically. And uh, that's, that sucks. On the other hand, CTV is pretty much perfectly suited to implement uh, ARCVIT. And, uh, and uh, it's actually more efficient anyhow. So with APO, you are doing a SIG signature operation, a SIGOP, uh, with, a, with a fake key or, or, or a throwaway key or a publicly known key, it doesn't really matter because it is the signature is being put into the, the witness script and not the, not the data. Part. Um, so it's not like a not like a normal uh, lock where where you have the pop key uh, basically uh, put in the witness script uh, and 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 uh, and just witness data. You add the signature as witness data. The, here the the signature is also part of the witness script because this is a covenant. When you are using APO as a covenant, then you do that, and that means that uh, you are going to have like. Uh, like a uh, hundred, hundred bytes um, around that. Uh, so with that root, you are going to have six, 65 bytes at least. And then you are adding another uh, signature that's other 64 bytes. And, and uh, so it's like 140 bytes at least. I think uh, that I, you are going to have uh, as witness data for this to work. Uh, and uh, CTV is just like 35 bytes. I, I think it's it's about half the size of uh, APO uh, on 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 the simplest case. So it's more efficient. Uh, it does not have a SIGOP. It's just a SHA-256 uh, uh, hash check basically. So it only it only calculates the SIG hash and compares it with the parameter. It's a much simpler, cheaper operation. It costs less CPU cycles for every node to validate it. It costs uh, less uh, space on chain uh, and actually making ARC possible, unlike APO. So that is that is the difference between the two. Awesome. Thanks a lot. We do have one person, person's hands up. So if you want to quickly ask your question, we would... I was uh, going to... Go ahead. I, I was going to quickly follow up on my last question uh, about... Uh, Arc preferring large uh, service providers, and and does that mean that there might only be like a handful, and can that be a problem, or like is that going to lead to like a centralization issue? And if it's not going to, is the reason it's not going to because it's trustless, and because that these arc providers have sort of reputation at stake, so that they will be incentivized to yeah. cooperate with you. Um, yeah. So as I, I, to I think, I think. You are going to have the same dynamics like with exchanges. And uh, basically the largest exchanges are the most trusted. But right now, today, with the largest exchanges, you are losing the most sovereignty. Right? They are the most invasive uh, uh, when it comes to you know getting into your life and, and casing you. They are they are enforcing the strictest regulations and and uh, you you still are not safe from rug pulls as FTX uh, uh, showed us. So even if it's a very large exchange, it can just go belly up any day uh, in reality. And you have no way of on-chain enforcing. Like you have no hope. If, if you had 100 BTC on an exchange that goes belly up, you are probably not going to see much of that uh, back. And with, uh, with ARC, if you have 100 BTC in an ARC, doesn't matter how large or small it is, you are going to get most of that back on chain, right? So that is a huge difference. If you are hodling, 
uh, hodling on an exchange just simply doesn't make sense if you have the option of hodling on ARC where you have privacy, you are more you are more permissionless uh, or, or uh, they can't actually really target you or know anything about you and you can enforce your, your claims on chain worst case, they can't really steal from you that way. So it's it's a whole different ball game for for hodlers, I believe, and it's a whole different ball game for people that just want to pay like uh, Coinbase can actually, or, or some other exchange can actually deny paying uh, certain invoices that certain services make that are not politically acceptable to the regulators of that exchange. So, so you you are not not going to have uh, probably this uh, uh, so very good experience. So, 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 like, if FTX or if Binance were running in Arc you could trust them because it's trustless and you can always go on chain and yeah. you know that they are incentivized to cooperate with you. So even if they have a bad reputation or even if they might have a, yeah. I, I, if, if they have a good reputation, but, but you, you fear that they are going to have a bad reputation, you can always settle on chain. Yeah. Uh, right. I, but I they can't say... provide exchange services. Let's, let's hold that. They so, can only so offer I... Bitcoin services. So I, I think it's, 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 really it's a small complex. I, I think it's really interesting that we're bringing up then this use case because it would make sense for decentralized DEXs to essentially have their own interoperability with ARC. Yes, so that Possibly. is that is something that you know we we plan on building with Sidekit, but it doesn't give you the exchange. You have to you have to give up more trust if you want actual exchange. So Art gives you like yeah. swaps, a comic swap. Yeah, I, I mean, what, what Jay is saying is if you want high, frequen high frequency trading, right? if you want a, a, a more immediate interaction with the price that is faster than what you can do. Uh, I mean, a lot of DEXs are, are more uh, slow, like you are putting in limit orders and, and someone takes them or not takes them. Something like that is definitely going to be possible with Arc, I believe. And it can be atomic and trustless. If you want uh, like high, high, higher frequency trading and uh, these more developed uh, uh, trading tools of stops and 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 whatever, um, you're probably going to need uh, up custody for that portion of of, of your BTXOs. But people who, who hold on exchanges, so they are rarely trading. They are like trading like twice a year or, or something like that. They are just rebalancing exactly. their strategy exactly. or whatever. Uh, and, and they are using it as a wallet. So a lot of people are using it as a, uh, a wallet. Yeah, uh, think of it as and, instant and, liquid, instant liquid network. Yeah. Like instant yeah. liquid network. And, and, as soon as you get out, you, you're in. Yeah. And you can't actually get stuck. So the other thing is uh, some people who already experienced, uh, you know, the, the raging bull markets coming with huge congestion on chain and, and the impossible fees were flying around. I have seen 9,000 sat per V by transactions and stuff like that at one point. So uh, it, it usually doesn't last very long, but, uh, but uh, if, if someone really tries to sell the top that he can afford to be off the exchange in such a way that it takes an on-chain <laughs> transaction to get back there maybe so there are there are reasons <clears throat> why people like to be on exchanges even if they yeah. in, in financial it. markets they call it reinvestment risk or, yeah. or liquidity risk yes so we take that so, so so with, with, if if an exchange run an arc uh, service uh, i think you would see that this improves by magnitudes And again, there would be no question that your funds are actually there. So, so if an exchange shows you a balance, you have no idea if they really have those funds. As we've seen with FTX, uh, which I heard, I don't know, but I heard that they didn't even have any Bitcoin. They sold a lot of Bitcoin and they didn't even have any Bitcoin specifically. So that is just not possible with ARC. I think that alone is, is a huge improvement that, that people really need to appreciate that you can just run a fractional reserve and, and don't have that risk that even, even if you have claims to the Bitcoin because you have lent it out or whatever, 
you don't have this risk that you can become insolvent. It's just not possible to get into this situation by accident or by by being a little bit, you know, uh, reckless. Uh, and and uh, and suddenly the users want to withdraw a mass, and and you are telling them, guys, I don't actually have your money. Please wait. And then everyone panics and loses their shit, and and then all hell breaks loose, and you are basically bankrupt. Uh, um, you are you are you are going belly up and uh, so so that whole thing just doesn't exist the users don't have the risk that this can happen to you you don't have the risk that this can happen to you but it is actually capital intensive if people move their money with large frequency if people are just holding if people are just uh, uh, moving their funds uh, uh, most of their liquidity they are just moving very slowly or very rarely and uh, they are paying these daily spending amounts with a higher frequency, then we will probably see that these, these large uh, operations are going to be able to, to provide liquidity for millions of people and maybe billions. I, I don't want to make too bold predictions, but we can, we can certainly see it theoretically possible. But can they and will they? Will exchanges run an arc? Will they feel that regulatory no, we pressure? Are, we, are, we are building the new exchange and we're going to make them. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the other thing. Yes. So, so it's, it, they, they either adopt it or, or we as Bitcoiners can decide to you know, just ignore them and let them die. So this is the thing with, uh, you know, people have been saying that uh, that wallet of Satoshi should just switch to from the account model should just switch to you know e-cash model but a lot of satoshi is not going to do that unless unless they are forced to right but also like but both the e-cash like the e-cash model is is could be viewed as as being a a mixing service and so would they want the regulatory pressure of being accused of being a mixing service is that going to cause them headache? But and why would you be day. the first one to bring that up? Like, why would you be looking for random U.S. laws that make no sense? I mean, it's not, so, it's not a mixing service. We know what it is. At the end of the day, the only way that this can work out well is we have a system that is permissionless to enter. You, you really only have to have the liquidity to enter. And... If someone has the liquidity and someone is willing to provide a service that the others are not willing to provide and the users want that service, they want, want, want access to that. Uh, if, if they are free to, to, to move to a business that caters to their needs better, then this, this Bitcoin thing can work uh, on these free market principles. And uh, if, if people are not actually doing that, if people are not valuing freedom and privacy, and uh, they are only looking for you know the cheapest uh, cheapest service that they can possibly get. Then we are going to end up with uh, fractional reserve and and the account system and KCM uh, bullshit push down everyone's throat the same as in the banking system, right? So that that is uh, that is how this thing will play out. All right, all right. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, before the session, Moon and I was talking about this uh, being a casual session, and then later we'll follow up with a more dense podcast style thing. Looks like this one already got extremely dense. We answered a lot of uh, different questions. So uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot, everyone who joined us, and especially thanks to Moon for. Uh, generously giving us his time and knowledge. So we'll try to follow up with this if, if we can, if time permits, with an article or, or a podcast. Uh, although I now feel a lot dumber than I felt before we get into this session. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I learned a lot, but then so many other questions since arose. yeah you you have you have a lot of questions when you when you dig into it and, and try to see how it will work at, at scale and we really don't know so like i said this is pioneer stuff we need to That's explore good. uncharted territory and and we need to be be a little bit bored about exploring this uncharted territory because 
Uh, that's the only way this thing can work. BIP, BIP 119. BIP 119. That's all. ACK BIP yeah. 119. It also raises the stakes for it, right? So we'll see how this, uh, how development, developments like this impact the discussion on CTV. Um, would there be any final uh, things you want to mention, Moon? Or any final points from anyone else? So if- we could yeah, go just, ahead. just real right. quick. Um, you know, I was going to say if you haven't already watched the whiteboard, uh, you know, masterclass that Sam and uh, Barack and um, oh man, forgetting his name. Sorry, sorry, the other guy who. Robin. Yeah, yeah, Robin. Robin. Thank you, Robin. It was a really good white whiteboard session. Oflo and I were there. A couple of other people who came in today were there. Um, I definitely recommend yeah. checking that one out. The sound, the sound was pretty horrible. But I think uh, they they managed to explain uh, and visualize some of the stuff that we talked about. Yeah, you know. the visuals really help. Um, I put it up in the nest, by the way. Um, there's uh, one thing that I noticed in the whiteboard talk that basically we didn't say it here, but they were comparing it to the opposite of liquid, where it's permissioned entrance and permissionless uh, um, uh, peg out. I I think that for, because we're just yeah. talking about exchanges and everything like that, I think that exchanges that do choose to set this up, they'll probably utilize that permission entrance to do KYC in those instances. So, yeah. I, uh, I, I, mean, I want, to, want to say something about it because if you say that Liquid has a permissionless entry, then... I'm saying that's bullshit because uh, you can send Bitcoin to an address, but it's their discretion if they are actually crediting you LBTC or not, or just screw you, uh, just take your Bitcoins and just screw you. So like, I don't think you can say that anything is permissionless in liquid. And uh, at least it ha- you have atomicity. In, if one ESP is not taking your money, doesn't want to uplift you, then other will, and you have atomicity, and they can't screw you. So it's it's very hard to compare it to liquid in that sense. It, we, we were comparing it as like the total opposite, and that was just you know from speaking with yeah. Barack and every, everything. And- Basically, the the concept is you. You permissionlessly peg into liquid um, with with this uh, arc. Essentially, you are permissionly um, pegging in. So that was the the main thing that I was yeah, noticing. Like I said, like I said it's, it's, it's not true. It's it's more of a from the perspective of if an exchange wanted to implement this, there's nothing stopping them from implementing this because they already do KYC. So they would just KYC their users into it. I mean, you can, but you will lose them. If they really implement ARC, then, then the, after the first mix, they lose track of them immediately. So what's the point? Totally. Yeah, so, so you, uh, an ESP can't really tell if you are sales spending or paying someone else, although the timing can give them a clue. So we have this thing with eCash when people are saying that eCash has this perfect privacy um, on paper and in theory and, and, and look that on a theoretical level and in isolation, but privacy is always a very, very complex game. So starting from stuff like, uh, you know, Moving the same amount in and out is just going to stand out. <laughs> it's a very, very plausible, uh, you know, uh, if you send uh, like five, 5,001 Satoshis into an eCash Mint and then you are paying an invoice for 5,000 Satoshis and paying the one Satoshi as fees, that's going to give a pretty good clue to the, to the uh, Mint that it's you. Especially if you are... If you are either using like a clear net to interface with the mean, then they are just going to uh, guess that the same IP address uh, and the same whatever uh, agent string in the HTTP request is, is just going to be you again. But if you are using, say, Tor and you are not bothering to get a new circuit and you have the same circuit, then again, they are going to have a pretty good idea that it's you. So you can't can just look at it in the full abstract 
you always have these timing correlations and 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 uh, and the network traffic correlations and stuff like that to consider when when you are talking about privacy. And in case of ARC, if you are waiting for the free swap uh, at the end, uh, you know, like uh, uh, before, just before the last day, you are you are trying to get a, a free swap over. Then the AST will guess with a very high probability that you are just, uh, you know, you are just uh, sell spending, basically. Of course, he can never know that, and he doesn't actually uh, know which output is yours because if a lot of people are in that coin join again, then then you are you are basically uh, hiding your input output uh, correlation. But if you are the only person in a coin join, or you are the only person in a coin join with a specific VTX amount, then you don't really have an set. You don't really have any privacy. It's all, it's just a theater. So it, it all depends. It all depends on a lot of things. A good wallet are is going any, to give you. Are there any benefits that zero knowledge proofs would add to the, the protocol? I mean, uh, you have zero knowledge proofs in a coin join already. So. You you you're gonna have zero knowledge proofs in the protocol to begin with, but uh, if uh, by that people mean like uh, some elaborate computation proof, uh, some elaborate uh, general purpose computation proofs, then I don't believe so. So in 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 particular for ARC, it's not not really something that uh, that is beneficial. I can see that uh, you know like. Uh, a Chomini Cash Mint that is running a proof of reserve scheme and is publicly committing to data that if everyone downloads and verifies, then they can see that the mint is not cheating. Maybe someone could aggregate that data and the operations and create a zero knowledge proof for it that is very, very dense. And people can just, you know, check this eight kilobyte or something ZK proof and know snark. that the mint a, is a not snark. That's a ZK snark. Yeah. yeah. ZK yeah, snark. yeah. So, so, so it's possible to do stuff <laughs> like that. It's possible to use that for for uh, building uh, fully validating nodes, so to speak, or, or almost fully validating nodes that can sync up in uh, like an instant to the Bitcoin main chain for people that don't have very good internet. So in a lot of peripheral ways, I think these, uh, these things are going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, helpful and applicable, but I don't really see how ARC uh, at its core would benefit from it right now. Maybe someone Not will come up. Not even for node infrastructure. Yes, the same way. Whatever Bitcoin, whatever Bitcoin script, if you could make, if you could process Bitcoin script faster, it would work for. Arc. Yeah, but it's it's very expensive to make these the computation. Yeah, but this, and, and I know, but I'm zk is on a whole nother level. This the zk yeah. snarks is like it's an inversion of control. I think it's. But possible. let's say so. So when when you are doing. Uh, coin join stuff and, and e cash stuff. For example, when, when you receive a, a DLAC proof, uh, uh, the, the, that is a zero knowledge proof. So, so you, you are going to have zero knowledge stuff in, in this, just not necessarily the way some people talk about it uh, in, in a more general sense. Basically, if you think about it, a, a signature check is a zero, zero. A signature is a zero knowledge proof because you can verify that someone used a private key, a specific private key, without knowing the private key. So it's almost, almost like, you know. Moon, there's one more project that you that you wrote called what was it called? Uh, dark pool or tar pit auto people tar pit like t-a-r-p-i-p-i-t tar yeah. pit yes so uh, uh, why yeah uh, you should have led with that tar pit one yeah so i i just want to mention that uh that uh it has advantages certain advantages to to arc that some people might actually like for example as people said with ARC, you have these various ways that 
that uh, 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 service provider, especially if you can maintain an online presence, so you can't enforce your property rights on chain, then he, he could basically maybe potentially steal from you. Um, with dark pool, it's just not possible really uh, for, for the coordinator or, or anyone else to steal from you. It has been constructed in a way that your property rights are absolute. But everything comes at a price, right? So, so that pool is, is very more interactive than ARC. Um, it needs a, a full interaction from the participants to advance the state in return. So you can't have it all. You can't, you can't have uh, less or non-interactivity and, and, uh, and this full property rights and stuff like that. And, uh, and uh, it does not have a timeout. So dark pool does not have this four week timeout. Uh, that the, the coordinator or the service provider can, can sweep you. Uh, the only thing that the rest of the participants can do to you if you stop cooperating is push you on chain and, and leave you alone and let you pay the on chain fees alone. So that's your punishment that you are going to have to pay your on chain fees alone. Uh, maybe it is possible to, to have uh, some sort of a DAO. So I have been thinking about, uh, you know, the non-cooperatives having to bear the burden of their non-cooperation and the on-chain fees that everyone incurs for the logarithmic ejection, you know, and that would somehow roughly look like uh, you are putting down a 1% uh, deposit into this uh, threshold multi-sig DAO. And uh, basically that means that the majority of the holders with the coordinator can spend your security deposit, not your, not your main savings account. So again, if we compare this to FTX, where, where you had your 100% of, uh, of your Bitcoin, if you had Bitcoin there, just, just uh, you know, it's gone. Like the, the South Park meme, you know, it's gone. Uh, here, here you can lose this 1% if everyone turns malicious and then you will never talk to them again. That's a very different ballgame because if you are hoarding Bitcoin, like uh, just from like uh, two days ago, we are down like, uh, I don't know how much, let me check. So, well, like 11%. Yeah, so 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 so, so <laughs> we are we are swinging more than one person daily, and uh, and probably most people are not going to be killed by uh, a one percent uh, loss at the worst case if if everyone really turns malicious. But if they are the asshole that is not cooperating and, and costing everyone as money, then it's perfectly reasonable for them to pay for that, to pay for that ejection. And this is an optional feature. So this is not part of dark pool's core design. It's just an afterthought that it would be really nice to make the non-cooperatives pay for the non-cooperation, like doubly. And that would be a strong incentive for people to not participate in, 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 in pools where the, the pre-agreed period can be, can be kept, right? Uh, the pre-agreed turnover period to new state because they, they just can't come online and and the people who can't uh, come online every day are not going to be participating in daily pools and uh, and stuff like that. So dark pool, if if uh, it has a way to immediately you know spend over lightning or or, or uh, uh, you know get through the same way that you are uh, doing it with Arc, that you are basically using the ASP, you are you are swapping out into a new pool or you are swapping out to lightning or to eCash through the ASP. Uh, you can do the same thing with dark pool. So at least if there is some problem with the general consensus or you want to really go fast and uh, within reason and within the liquidity available to the, to the operator, he, he can actually swap you out in various ways. And uh, that means that uh, I expect that dark pool would have uh, liquidity requirements similar to how banks operate and how other financial institutions operate, where you have this uh, so-called float that is like a two to 5% tops uh, on the holdings. And that is the extra liquidity that he needs to have plus what he, he maintains in the, the, the lightning channels. And it doesn't need to be so over collateralized as ARC. So it's going to be cheaper than ARC for holders. So yield, and yield farming? Are we bringing yield farming to Bitcoin now? I mean, I I'm not, not asking for a friend. I did not mention yield farming at all. <laughs> 
I, I said I said it's not going to be as liquidity intensive as an arc pool. It's not going to be as fast. I, I call it dar tarpid because it will be hard to see anything. It will be hard to move in general, like like if you are stuck in tar. Uh, and uh, and uh, that is the worst case, of course. If people are cooperating, everything is peachy. So all these UTSO sharing protocols are somewhat optimistic. They are all preparing for a worst case, and 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 they are all generally optimistic, and uh, and we need to be optimistic with them, um, but we need to have some plans for you know the less cooperative, more pessimistic parts, and we just have to figure things out, I guess. So, like I said, dark pool has different trade offs to work. Your property rights are absolute. Uh, it is more interactive, and uh, and. Uh, and less liquidity intensive. So it, it might actually be better for hodlers, long-term hodlers, it, it might actually be better. And it can be arbitrarily slow because it's for mainly for- So there's no time out and there's no risk as long as I save my data, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, and, and again, if everyone else has the data and they don't want their money to be stuck, then you don't even need your backup. You you're, you only need with our pool your, your static pool template backup and and your seed that generates your private keys. Those are the two things that you need, uh, but that depends on people actually ejecting you to on-chain. So ejecting your VTXs on-chain when you don't cooperate. If everyone loses this, uh, this state, this uh, off-chain state that you have in these pools, then obviously you are in trouble. So, so that is true for all of these, but that's not really realistic and let's face it, so, so you have a professional coordinator, you, you have a lot of users who all are interested in keeping their own money. And why would everyone lose the state? And why wouldn't they share it? Because it's really, really cheaper for everyone. There is, there is, there is something called, there is an exponential explosion of state in, on bad protocols at the point of, yeah. of no, you know, when, when there's no more derivative of the line right there. So you got to be careful. That's what happens. With yeah, the, yeah, yeah. But uh, with the quadratic. With dark pool, actually, you don't have this problem because every time you you actually manage to make a new state transition, or the old state is immediately prunable. It doesn't mean anything; it's worthless. So, so you always just have the the actual uh, state of the actually what you strictly need because dark pool is made in a way that the whole off chain state is deterministically generated from you know the the UTXO basically and the public key set. So if you have the public key set, wow, then you then you can generate the entire nice. thing from the dude. Yeah. And this this wow. makes this makes fuck this makes the this makes the the, the coordination of everything really uh, you know um, uh, efficient as fuck uh, to to say that. Um, so it, it's going to be I don't know it's it's a different trade off. For different people, we will see if it if it sees adoption. But dark pool is not for daily spending, so I would like to say that it was designed to be a companion uh, for show many cash means. So I assume that people are going to use for daily spending this cheap, fast, uh, agile show many cash means. Daily spending amounts are probably easily replaceable even for poor people and for rich people especially. And I wanted to provide something for savings. So not everyone can afford to have savings, not everyone has savings, but those people who have savings should not be exposed to the rack potential of, of exchanges and custodians in my view. And I wanted to give for savings an optimistic way to, to really uh, manage and, and, uh, and reduce your, your exposure to the on-chain fee market and, and to all this. With the, like I said, with the extra that uh, you can actually swap out if, if the coordinator, if the Mint has the liquidity, he can, he can swap you out and, and give you access to the Lightning Network and to eCash immediately. And uh, that means that you are not really necessarily stuck. If everyone wants to do this at once, then the, the Mint would need uh, the same liquidity uh, requirement as an ARC pool has on the baseline basically so but but if if not everyone wants out at the same time then it's much more manageable all right 
So I, I actually think that's really interesting because and what, what came to my mind is ASPs that essentially will lock up their liquidity for a year to two years. For example, obviously, we don't know what um, MicroStrategy will, will do, but this is just an example. Let's say that they locked up 50,000 Bitcoin or 100,000 Bitcoin for two to three years, but they were getting... Um, a yield on that by locking it up as an ARC service provider and then essentially offering that service to the public. I could see certain benefits in that. And if they're a long, long time preference, they don't lose anything. Also, the benefit I could see with that is if people wanted to build programmable layers on top of ARC, utilizing things like RGB, they could do it much easier without um, that refreshing every four weeks. So that's something I'm throwing out there. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm still not seeing how uh, stuff like RGB can be built on top of work, but uh, who knows? I'll show you. It's possible. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. So uh, the other thing I guess I, I wanted to mention is um, when we are talking about someone like a venture capitalist, a company, an institution, someone want to wanting to lock up large amount of Bitcoin, but in a way that they can't really like lose it. They don't have the same risk exposure as with uh, say Lightning, right? Uh, where you have basically a hot wallet, you, you have the Lightning balance uh, very much exposed to hacks and, and whatever uh, mishaps. Um, I'm sure this will be improved in the future, but uh, you would probably have, if you activate CTV, uh, you would have the option to do something I call the surf chain. Basically, you can start a, a, a fairly trust minimized uh, side chain where people can use your liquidity and they will pay, pay you an interest for using that liquidity. And this interest will be paid automatically with the blind merge mining. You would have no control over the consensus of the side chain. You completely give up control, but you are insisting on getting paid at a predefined schedule. And the side chain is burning coins on a predefined schedule, and you are retrieving coins on chain at a predefined schedule. And this whole thing is, is driven forward by the people who are uh, trying to assemble blocks for the side chain. And that means if people are not using your side chain, you are going to lose money. Instead of getting paid, you will have to drive this contract forward. You have to pay the on-chain fees. You are losing money. So yeah, you're really that's... interested, really interested in getting people to to want to use your side chain. You really need to estimate the liquidity requirements that people have there. Well, because if you put in too much, then you are going to lose money. If you are put, putting too little, that's better because you can always add. Uh, to it and and uh, basically uh, just a simple covenant like CTV can can open up several ways where large amounts of capital can be can can be allocated efficiently and providing service and liquidity to people who want to transact off of Bitcoin main chain. Uh, so so we already like covered like <laughs> three examples of it that, that just came up before we activated this. And imagine when thousands of developers, you know, like these, these gigabrain autists are, are going to have a Lego piece that is actually activated and they are starting to look at it and what they can do with it. And uh, we would probably see a Cumbrian explosion of ideas. So, so we are not, we are not like stuck with the, these three proto ideas forever. They are going to evolve. They are going to interact. People are going to figure out new things. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on a potential future where you know CTV is activated on Bitcoin and, and uh, like I said, thousands of developers are going to uh, get a new primitive to, to, to build more trust minimized or more trustless. Uh, solutions and, and, and systems and incorporate it into an, everything. Amen, Moon. All right. So, a happy note. Is it time to wrap it up, Moon? I think so. I'm pretty spent. Yeah, I know it's also late. 
time zone. All right. Okay. So thanks a lot, everyone. And, Great chat. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think it was a wonderful chat. Yeah.